What's up, nerds? Welcome all you Chad nerds out there. We got our fancy setup. We got it back to the classics. Going back to allowing the opponents, the haters, the dissers, the debaters, the wannabe maters, throwing tomatoes, letting them on the live stream to make their best arguments, to make their case. As you know, we've we've done this for years. We've always let the opponents have the opportunity to come make whatever arguments they want. And why is that? Is it because we're mean? It's so mean. No, it's because there's not we're not afraid of opposing positions. And the way it works is you request to speak, and I will give you the microphone. You can speak for as long as you want. But it has to be on the topics that we're covering. And it has to be coherent. You can't talk for an hour. But if you want to make a case for five minutes, ten minutes, I don't really care. You can make whatever argument you want. And the reason for that is that we don't actually fear any of the opposing people's arguments. Now, an argument is an actual academic presentation or a logical coherent presentation an argument is not yelling and talking about people's drama or their backstories or that's not what an argument is if the topic of debate was whether i'm an evil sorcerer or kgb drug lord then it might be relevant to present those so-called facts that you think you have but that's not the topic the topic is what's listed as the topic Roman Catholicism, atheism, Protestantism, Islam, geopolitics, perhaps, philosophy, transcendental arguments, theology, all those are on the table. So if you want to talk about those, you want to make a, if you think I'm wrong about something, that's fine. And by the way, I don't even have a problem being wrong about something. <gasps> Shocker. It's actually okay to be wrong about things. Like your career is not ended if you got something wrong. Or if you think that's how it works, then there's something wrong with you. <clears throat> so I'm happy to have someone correct me on something. It's not that big of a deal. But the way to do it is to present an argument. And unfortunately, we're in such a terrible climate of stupidity, ignorance. It's very difficult to actually have rational, coherent debate. It's almost nigh impossible nowadays outside of a few people. And for so many people, you know, they think that saying something sort of insulting, right? Which is part of rhetoric. That disqualifies you from debate and makes you mean. This is just absurd. And usually usually these are the same people who tout that they're the descendants of the Templars and they're the descendants of the Crusaders and they're the, the toughest ama most amazing internet philosophy people but they cower at a single insult or joke fragile individuals who can't handle the slightest bit of criticism the slightest bit of joking and prodding and these people are just kind of disgusting to me. I mean, the ones that, that trumpet all of their piety signaling and their virtue signaling on their channel nonstop. And all they do is when you criticize someone, they call you to repentance. I mean, this is like the weakest possible psyche imaginable. Just, just weird. Just this desire to try to demonstrate in some performative way that you're righteous on the internet. There's just something bizarre about this. It has nothing to do really with God or theology or anything like that. It really just has to do with weird narcissism. So we're going to open it up. <clears throat> the way it works is on Twitter, you have spaces. Twitter spaces don't work on PC. They only work on cell phones. You have to request to speak. That means you'll be muted when you come on automatically. <clears throat> that means you have to unmute yourself. Please don't make me say 500 times unmute, dude. Even though I know I will be saying unmute, dude, for 500 times in the next two hours. It's just the laws of the universe, baby. It's just how it works. 
<clears throat> so we're gonna see who we got over here. By the way, I gotta. I'm gonna have to turn. The, it's hot up in here. I'm getting. <clears throat> I'm getting a little toasty up in here. Let's put some music on for a second, and I'm gonna have to go turn the air on. It's hot. I'm reminded of blood sports, that short lived internet phenomena of mudslinging and drama and piling on. And although really it wasn't that fruitful per se, one of the good things about blood sports was that when you have a giant audience of, let's say, 5,000 people in a Worski stream years ago piling on and calling you every name in the book. There's something good about that in the sense that it sort of makes you immune to people making fun of you on the internet, criticizing you on the internet. It's not a big deal because the next day, nobody remembers, nobody cares. But a lot of people are so fragile, they can't take a single joke and or criticism from, quote, the internet, from their audience. They're so scared, so weak, so fragile. And to me, this is just pathetic, right? I mean, just the, the state of these internet so-called apologists and weirdos, all of them, I'm talking about, <clears throat> I'm not in the Orthodox sphere. There's a few in the Orthodox sphere who are, who are insufferable and ridiculous. But the Protestant virtue signalers and the soy apologists, half these guys, by the way, you notice they're all soy men, right? Why is that? It's just the weirdness. The, this whole sphere just attracts. And that's one reason I, didn't, I don't, I had to take a break from doing this. Because there's so many weirdos and so many people who, I don't, I don't even know how to describe it. Something is off with a lot of people who are attracted to this sphere of things. And it creates these weird delusional people who the internet for them is a way to constantly one up. I just don't understand it. Just all these weirdos. They're, they're, it must be the case that their actual lives are just total garbage to live a life on the internet where you're gaining what dopamine hits, I guess, from feeling like you're explaining to everyone your superiority. For example, I was looking at the comments under the video that clip that Pajo had uploaded of our conversation from a year or two ago, whatever it was. And he uploaded a clip and not everybody, but there was probably 10 people in the comments out of, you know, 100, 200 comments saying, I can't believe you would associate with this person. He's mean and it, just weird shit. Just like what? And then in the sphere of even an orthodoxy, right? The problems in the orthodox world, for example, everyone feels the need to just, just moralize on the internet. It's just so weird. Nobody gives, nobody is tabulating your virtues on the internet, dude. Nobody is watching to see, oh, random commenter, you know, 69. made an amazing comment about how much he prays and how we shouldn't be debating. We should be praying. I mean, just, just garbage, dude, get out of here. Those are the people who actually run people off. You're going to scare people away from the gospel. Well, maybe you have a soy gospel. That's not the gospel. And who would want to be in your weird soy narcissist Skittles cult? Anyway, all these people are, it's all soy men, dude. That's all it is. All right, it's open forum. You can make whatever arguments you want. And by, I, by the way, I don't even care if you want to come on and say that I'm a, a KGB sorcerer. It doesn't, I, it doesn't bother me anymore. It's, it's funny. Tom, what's up, dude? <clears throat> Tom, ta -dum, Tom. Tom. 
Unmute. Unmute. Uh, how are you doing today, Jay? Great, man. What's up? Yeah, yeah. Lovely to be here. Um, listen, I just had a question for you. Um, I'm a Catholic, and um, I'm know, sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just joking. <laughs> I'm just joking, man. But um, I just wonder. I just had a question about Eucharistic adoration. Um, why is that not practiced in Eastern churches? Right, so there is a version of that that occurs during the liturgy of the pre-sanctified gifts. But in the Latin church, <clears throat> this arose as a practice that was eventually disconnected from the liturgical celebration of the community. So for us, it doesn't make any sense to have <clears throat> Eucharistic adoration divorced from the actual full-on liturgical service. And that's why there's so many things that what trad cats think is, you know, quote, trad cat Catholicism is actually just a Latin medieval or a post Tridentine development. The ancient church didn't do that because they didn't separate communion or the reverencing of the gifts from the entire liturgical celebration, which includes the entire community. Uh, yeah. All right. Well, Thanks for your answer. Um, I mean, are, are you, you are you aware that like that didn't occur in the first thousand years? Oh, yeah, no, absolutely. It's a development within the church. But obviously, as uh, Roman Catholics, we would see that as completely valid as, as a part of uh, this beautiful process that, that God has put into place. How is theology a process when we're told in the canons of the ancient councils that theology is not a process that doesn't evolve? It doesn't evolve, but we discover, like we, you know, the Trinity, for instance, wasn't formally defined instantly, right? So you think the so Trinity it, is a discovery? Uh, yeah, we, we, yeah. We so it wasn't, them. so it wasn't taught in the Old Testament? Uh, it wasn't defined. Nobody did define it in that way. So, so something is not the case until it's discovered and defined? Well, we're not aware of it until that happens, right? How did then? How did the stuff. how did the New Testament writers argue the Trinity from the Old Testament? Well, so they didn't. That's the thing. I mean, you're saying the the, the the New Testament writers didn't argue the deity of the of Christ and the deity of the Holy Spirit from the Old Testament. They argued the elements of it, but they didn't actually argue the full. How can you argue definition of it? How can you argue the elements? Do you understand that the dogmatic definitions are just explicating what's there? Sure, but they uh, help us understand it more fully, right? And the point is, we didn't actually understand okay, it but to that degree. No, wait a minute. That's You said discovery. That's different than understanding it fully. Well, you're discovering more about it, right? So again, the New Testament writers argue the Trinity from the Old Testament. How does Justin Martyr argue against Trifo? Well, I mean, I, I'm not as well read as you on, on that side, but... Well, hold uh, on. So this is this is pretty... Well, hold on. This is a pretty important for the history of Trinitarian theology. I would think you would know that since you're arguing for the development of doctrine. What's the, well, no, I, what's I the course of the argument? What's the course of argument that Justin Martyr takes with Trifo, the Jew? Well, uh, this is an argument of... Like, this is commonality between us. So we both believe that, you know, these things actually were revealed to us, you know, through a process. That's, yeah. But I mean, see, your church teaches that the Old Testament taught a Unitarian deity and, the, and that the New Testament revelation is of the Trinity. I don't believe that. And I'm showing you that the New Testament writers don't believe that because how does Jesus argue for the relationship of the Father and the Son in the book of John? Well, that's the thing. It's, it's nuanced. It's, um, there's so much uh, con is context dependent. It really depends on what How does he argue in John 5? Well, look, I, I would need to get my Bible out if you want to talk about that. But look, I mean, I got mine out. Let's go to it. Do you want to see what he no, says but, in John? Jay, Jay, we're in Don't repeat my name. Don't chat. repeat my name. So, right. So I'm asking, I'm, and you're giggling. I'm asking you basic but, Trinitarian questions. We agree. Why, no, we don't. Why do we need to we don't. We I, I just told you fundamental disagreements. The Old Testament the doctrine of the Trinity is why we believe in the Trinity. That's why Jesus refers to the relationship of Moses on the mountain in Exodus and he says, I'm the one talking to Moses on the mountain in John 5 to the Pharisees. Okay. In John 16, 17, he talks at 15, 16, 17, he talks about the Holy Spirit. That Holy Spirit is all throughout the Old Testament as a distinct person. And that's why, for example, 
many of today's rabbis admit multiplicity in God in the Old Testament. The New Testament writers constantly refer to the Old Testament to prove the Trinity. The word Trinity has nothing to do with whether or not the doctrine of the Trinity is taught. And that's why the Trinity is in the Old Testament. Because Abraham believed in Father, he believed in Angel of the Lord Logos, and he believed in the Holy Spirit. That's what the icon of the three visitors to Abraham means. So if you understood Trinitarian theology, you would know that. That's basic in Orthodox theology. Roman Catholic theology does not have that as basic because Roman Catholic theology does not have the Trinitarian doctrine that is correct. It has a heterodox development of doctrine. And you guys prove the development of doctrine, like Trent did in the debate with Trent, by saying that the Old Testament teaches a Unitarian deity and the New Testament teaches the Trinity. That is categorically false. So when Justin Martyr debates Trifo the Jew, he argues the Trinity from the Old Testament. That's before the codification of the doctrine of the Trinity. So you understand that theology is taught before the words are used. But Roman Catholicism confuses explication of doctrine with development of doctrine. And that's how you got to all the innovations of what you're talking about, of Eucharistic adoration, and a thousand other things in papalism that has nothing to do with biblical theology, nothing to do with patristic theology, and violates all the canons of the first seven ecumenical councils. Wow, okay. So, look, I think that was beautiful. You, um, you know, taking part of the Old Testament and using that to support the doctrine of the Trinity. Totally no, hold on. Do you understand? Jesus and the, the church fathers do that. You said I'm doing it. Jesus yeah. and the church fathers yeah, do no. that. Well, you, you repeated it, but that's beautiful. I totally agree. But, uh, do they not do that? But, but Jay, you said do they not do that? Why are you repeating my name? Do they not do that? Yeah, they do. They do. Uh, but Jay, you said something quite interesting. You actually said that Orthodox um, and, and Roman Catholics, we actually have different definitions of the Trinity. I, Absolutely. I think that's quite an extreme position. No, it's, it's 100% factual. How so? Because there are medieval councils excommunicating one another over the Trinity. So in what way does, does our definition of the Trinity differ from yours? Well, I just gave you an example that the Old Testament doesn't teach a Unitarian deity. I agree. So natural theology is not true because natural theology usually predicates that the Old Testament teaches a Unitarian deity and the Trinity is a New Testament revelation. If you read into it, but I mean... Read I, into it. Again... So is that I, not I, Vatican II's doctrine of natural theology or, or is it? I, I think it's... Uh, you know, an oversimplification. No, this is why no, Nostra- no, your your church teaches that Muslims and Christians believe in the same God because they're monotheistic. Do you agree with that? No, again, that's that's not what it says. Yes, it does. Um, it's an interpretation. Of no, that, but let, let's well, hold on. We are, we so are, wait a minute. It's an interpretation. I thought Vatican II and the documents of dogma are are the interpretation. So you're saying that that's an interpretation of an interpretation. Look, Jay. Why do you keep repeating my name? Can you address the argument instead of look, Jay, 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 look, Jay, look, Jay, what? Jay. Why have you got a problem with me saying your name? Because it's a deflection and it's a stupid tactic that's like NLP. What? I'm just addressing you. What? Why are you giggling? I, that's crazy. What's <laughs> this <saying your name? laughs> is this guy? Yeah. Okay. What would you rather be? <laughs> <mean? laughs> Enough of that. Fumples. Right, so the you see what happens is that they do the exact same thing. They always do this. Rather than address specific points, they do this condescending giggle. Especially the Brits and the Australians, they're all they all do this exact same thing. Jay, it's a problem. Why is it? Why is it? Why is it? What's the problem? Jay, Jay, look, Jay. Can you not have a conversation that sticks to the points and addresses them? You don't have to say my name 50 times. Look, Jay. Look, Jay. Look, Jay. Look, Jay. Look, Jay. Look, 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 Jay. Look, Jay. Look, Jay. Look, Jay. Come on. And that condescending giggle, dude, get out of here with that. And the Roman Catholics are always like, you're so mean. You're so mean. But I have to listen to a condescending giggle, infinitely repeating my name and not addressing any point that was raised. Bumples.
Oh, yo, hello, Jay. Did you hear Ted Kaczynski died? No. He died, man. He died in prison. Interesting. So, anything to do with what we're talking about today? I'm not trying to be mean to you, but it's open. Uh, it's open forum debate on Roman Catholicism, Protestantism, atheism. Not Ted Kaczynski Day. Yeah, yeah. Well, with Roman Catholicism, I have a maybe a question about the what's. Have you ever addressed the Pope Agatha question? I feel like you have, but if you, if you have anything to say about it, I, I'd like to you maybe mention it because I saw some Roman Catholics say something that Pope Agatha apparently proves something to do with the Pope. Yeah, well, I mean, we've addressed it probably 500 times. So uh, you can go to um, the Denny book on papalism. The chapter on Pope Agatha is great because, <clears throat> number one, it shows that it's not papalism for two key reasons. First of all, the council itself excommunicates the prior pope. So that shows that the papacy is not the rock and it is defectible because the council and three subsequent councils also that continue to repeat the anathema of Honorius clearly didn't interpret the statement of his letter to be infallible. So just because a pope claims something in a letter, it doesn't mean that therefore the entire church accepts that. Furthermore, Pope Martin had already condemned monothelitism. If this was a papal situation, there would not have been a council. They would have just looked to the prior condemnation of monothelitism by Pope Martin. They would not have spent time investigating the letter of Agatho to see if it was orthodox. Just like they investigated the letter of Leo to see if it matched up with St. Cyril. So when you read, when you understand that context, then it, the, uh, the papalist argument is absolutely nothing. <clears throat> yeah. Okay, well, that's about it. I'll get you someone else now. Right, yeah. well, nice talk to you again. Haven't spoke here in a while. Yeah, man, thank you. Good question. Good question. Stag. Oh, hi, Jay. Uh, sorry. Um, I just turned on the spaces, like, right when you said you are going to start uh Okay. speakers and so i'm not sure exactly what the debate is about but i just had it like, so it's open forum debate or q a it doesn't have to be debate the topics are roman catholicism protestantism atheism islam pagans uh philosophy biblical theology geopolitics okay i just had a question about the masoretic uh the bibles like aren't they the word god wasn't it uh, based off of Yahweh or Elohim or El, which are words that they don't know what it means exactly. So like, no, they're just so they're just terms like the word divinity, right? So the it's like saying divinity can be a generic descriptor or of a god, of a demon, or of the true God. So it's no different than the word divinity. So people make dumb word concept foul I'm not talking about you but people just make word concept fallacy mistakes of thinking that the word divinity is a proper noun it's not okay that's interesting just like uh, the word god is not a proper noun because it can be used for gods it can be used for god it can be used for the divine nature it can be used for the divine persons it can be used for divine energies the word God can pick out different things. It doesn't pick out one single thing. And probably 80% of people's, uh, not you, but dumb theological mistakes and errors are about things like this. For example, Muslims think that the word God can only pick out Allah in his unity and his simplicity, as if the word God can't pick out multiple things. Okay. Um, and like the words Holy Spirit, like spirit, it was from the Hebrew Hebrew word ruach, mm -hmm. meaning like they don't know, they have two meanings on what they think that word originally meant, but it was like either Well, way, again, so or, spirit, or, could, uh, spirit could pick out a human spirit, an angelic spirit, or it could pick out the divine spirit. They're generic terms that can pick out different things. What do you think about these new ancient technology, like... I guess they call them conspiracy theories, but like the, that there was an ancient society with like good, good, like better technology than we have now, 10,000 years ago. 
uh, before the cataclysmic event. Yeah, I suppose the... that's possible. I mean, if the Book of Enoch is telling us, uh, you know, some kind of story like that, then and that's that's possible, but it's very speculative. So, good questions. Let's move on. Varangian. All right, try to try to come back in. I can't hear you. You're not making any sounds. Mean Badger, what's up, dude? Unmute. Unmute, guys. When you come on, you're muted. You got to unmute yourself. He's so mean. Imagine saying the same thing 500 times. And you think I'm mean. I used to wonder why uh, radio sh show hosts and TV, like why they would kind of get like seemingly fussy. You know, when you see the Bill O'Reilly clip or when you see uh, the clips of Laura Ingram and she's being uh, kind of rude. It's because when you work or do things in media, there is this never ending thing that you always have to do that gets really annoying because you want to move on and do things. And so when you have to tell people to unmute, like every time it gets really annoying for you to have to do it. Does that make sense? And then everybody's just like, look how impatient he is. Look, we're more virtuous than him. We've won. We've won. <laughs> He's not virtuous. We are great. We have defeated him. So look, dude, unmute. How hard is it? Everybody spends all day on their freaking phones and people can't figure out. How long has Twitter happened? Twitter has been a thing for a long time. Spaces have been a thing for a long time. All you got to do is unmute. Like it's not hard. And by the way, I'm having fun ranting about it before the people will clip this and be like, we've got him. We've got him. He's not virtuous. We knew it all along. <laughs> it's a glorious day for us soy males. We've won. <laughs> That's how a soy male exults in his soyness, by the way. That's how they act. Jonathan, what's up, dude? Don't be mean to me. <laughs> Hey, Jake, can you hear me? Yes, sir. So, um, I've been doing uh, some research and all this theological stuff. And, you know, a lot of different camps have some good arguments. And I was curious what your path was to figure out how you ended up being orthodox rather than somebody in one of the other camps. Well, I mean, that's kind of an involved question. I don't mind answering it. Uh, by the way, guys in the chat, if you would hit like and share over on YouTube, we got uh, a nice 400 crowd over there. Let's, uh, get, let's get those numbers up. Let's get those numbers up. Uh, and if you want to support the show, you can via the Super Chat function, which is through Streamlabs. Why is your channel monetized? Because I got demonetized a long time ago. So Super Chats are via Streamlabs. That's the Streamlabs link right there. So, I mean, there's a lot of... I mean, I had a, a kind of a, a long journey to orthodoxy through being raised Protestant and then Calvinist. I got into Calvinism and Bible college. I did Bonson Seminary. And then I got into Roman Catholicism, track Catholicism throughout my 20s, 8, 9, 10 years-ish. Uh, and then I, I got into orthodoxy, but I wasn't ready. <laughs> in 2007 or 8 so it took me about 10 years to come around to orthodoxy and i spent a long time going through kind of agnostic phase uh not not agnostic like there's no god but like agnostic to the different um traditions of you know christianity so called uh but i think ultimately for me it was seeing the um the problem positions in protestantism the contradictions between pre and post Vatican II Roman Catholicism, which has only been accentuated in the last 20, 20 years or so, 
um, spending time in both of those worlds, as well as continuing to get deeper into uh, the Eastern Church Fathers, the history of the church, the various uh, councils, and what the Roman Catholic canons and councils were saying versus the canons of the first thousand years of the church. Those were kind of the big uh, deciding factors for me, as well as biblical theology. Okay, that makes sense. Because, you know, like, I don't want to just make a decision based off of, like, how I feel exactly. No, right? sure. You can't uh, base it on that. This no. is, like, a really, you know, emotionally involved thing. So it's not like you can just, like, figure out from some sort of unbiased perspective. Right, I right. I can't distance myself. <coughs> right. So I, I, I guess I was just trying to figure out how to do it. And... You know, sooner than later, because, you know, it would kind of suck to be in the wrong church and end up in a car crash, so. Well, yeah, I mean, I think that I wouldn't base my decision on fear. Uh, I wouldn't base it on uh, emotions. I think the only way to do it is to base it on spending time in the material and looking at the different arguments. Because any other basis that you do, if you make a choice on that, it's not going to, you're not going to be content with that you're going to be you know when you're orthodox for a year and you start seeing problems in the orthodox church you're going to uh move on to something else because the basis for which you came in was not solid so i think that emotions and you know frets and concerns they play a role but they can't ultimately be the deciding factor so i would say it has to be on the basis of the, the history, the theology, the objective facts. That's literally the only way to do it. Otherwise, you're going to be wandering through a mirage, uh, uh, through a maze of bad arguments and bad reasons. And a lot of times people choose churches for bad reasons, and that's the worst thing to do. For example, well, I'm going to be a trad cat because I can be politically based. Okay, that that's nothing to do with what Jesus is preaching in the gospel, right? Yeah. Jesus is not preaching, making you politically based. Now, there might be an outworking of political basement down the road but the whole purpose of this is the transformation of you right and theosis if that's not your goal it's not if that's not the actual experience then you're in a religion of dead works that is really just a model for some kind of political thing and i think that's principally what papalism is papalism is the worship of authority and <clears throat> something that eventually became geopolitical and humanistic. It is not ultimately about you undergoing repentance and transformation of yourself. That's why everything in that system is, is this weird transactional thing uh, where I do whatever I want. I can be ridiculous all week and, and act like a behemoth. And then I go to confession and do my little transaction and uh, I'm good. I mean, this just is ridiculous. Like the whole point of the religion is to for you to undergo transformation and to become a partaker of the divine nature. And like I, I see that, like that, that's that's what I want. Like you would ask most Christians that question. I think they would say that. You know, may, maybe not all of them, right? But the, the ones that will like read their Bible every day and pray and things like give a church every. That seems like a pretty generic Christian answer. So, okay, well, so let's be precise. I'm not putting you on the spot. I know, I know, you're not necessarily debating, but. I mean, what are some of the objections that you have? Like, do you think Protestantism is more appealing or Roman Catholicism as opposed to Orthodoxy? <clears throat> well, you know, I, I never really could figure out the whole <clears throat> thing, and I was raised Anglican. Hold on. So I didn't hear you cut out the whole what? The whole papal infallibility deal. That just seems very sus. Yeah. Having come in 1,800 years after yeah. Peter. Sure. I mean, am, I, am I dumb in thinking that's suspicious? Uh, no, I've made the, that very argument many times, <laughs> so I don't think that's dumb. Yeah. So, I mean, if, if there is one true church, right, then I, I, I guess I would have to default to orthodoxy. But on the, the other hand, like, I, you know, I've seen a lot of good things happening in these Protestant areas. You know, like they'll become Christian, just generic Christian, and then, you know, their whole life is turned around, and it really seems like they do love Jesus. So it's like, I mean, how do I square that? with there's the, the whole there's only one church well the fact that there's good things that happen and there's graces that exist in the outside the church is fine that doesn't but and that doesn't mean that those people aren't having a real experience of grace or that they're not moving towards christ but that doesn't negate the fact that there's only one body 
you know, Jesus says, for example, that uh, there would be one flock and one shepherd. And he said, and Paul says that there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one body. So you can't have that existing amongst thousands of different sects. There's got to be one. And the only one that has the same theology of the first thousand years is the Orthodox Church. There's literally no other one. So I think that what happens is that God's grace is everywhere, right? The Holy Spirit is omnipresent. And Maximus has, uh, there's a great uh, section in Ad Thalassium where he talks about the different modes of the, the presence of the Holy Spirit. So there's a mode of the presence of the Holy Spirit that's everywhere, that's unique, uh, that's distinct from the mode of his presence in the Orthodox Church. So it's certainly true that people are being experiencing grace, but that grace is always a movement towards orthodoxy. It's always a movement towards the source of that grace, which is the actual body of Christ. When Jesus became incarnate, he took on an actual historical physical body, right? And that same appellation of his body is said to the historical church, meaning, mm -hmm. meaning that it is also a historical reality that's a physical, actual, local presence. And if you think about the Protestant interpretations of, say, Ephesians or Corinthians, when Paul's writing his letters, most Protestants, especially if they're coming from like a Calvinist, classical Protestant perspective, they believe that those letters are written to the, quote, invisible church, the true Christians that exist amongst the 30,000 sects. But that's not who Paul's writing those letters to. They're not addressed to the invisible church at Corinth, the invisible church at Ephesus. They're written to actual historical churches like Ephesus, where Paul appointed Timothy to be bishop. You see? Yeah. And so the Orthodox Church, for example, there's still a bishop of Ephesus. Mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the historic church. So the fact that people in other groups experience promptings and the pullings of grace does not mean that therefore they are also the true church. That's the non sequitur. Okay. I guess, I guess another question I'd have is... Let me give you an example. There's there a couple chapters in Acts. Okay. I think it's like uh, 8 or 9 and then maybe like nine, uh, nine, uh, 18 or 19 where the apostles, Paul and the apostles, they go out and they find disciples. Yep. And they go ahead and say, it's great that you guys have this faith. In one case, they are uh, disciples of John who had not heard about the laying on of hands and the Holy Spirit. Okay. And the Orthodox study Bible is great on that on those sections because it explains that Paul is representing the episcopacy, and he he brings these people under the episcopate. See, okay. So he brings yeah. them under. He doesn't say you had no experience of grace at all. He says this is great, but you need to be under the episcopacy, and that's what if you look at the history of the Orthodox Church, for example, the Antiochians. When you had there was a large group uh, in the in the eighties of evangelicals that suddenly got interested in orthodoxy, right? Yep. And what did the Antiochians do? The Antiochians said, uh, we will bring you in under the Episcopate, doing the very thing that Paul did. So that's the, I think that's the right approach, is to not completely deny people's experiences in Protestantism wholesale, but to say, that's great, but you need to come into the church and be under the Episcopacy. And that's why Jesus oh. says, when they, uh, when the apostles see the guy casting out demons, they say, should we forbid him? And Jesus says, we can't, we shouldn't forbid anybody because anybody who's truly doing these things in my name, they will soon be with us. You see? So that text, which people always use to try to prove ecumenism, it's not actually a proof of ecumenism. It's proof that Jesus actually says, no, if he, if he's serious, he'll join us. <laughs> I'll have to reread those passages with that in mind, but thank you. Yeah. Any more questions? Um, wh where does tradition start and where does it stop? Like, wh like what, what constitutes the tradition, right? Because, you know, you can say, okay, we've got this saint said that, that saint said <coughs> that. How do you say, you know, th this is a holy tradition, this writing of this saint, and this is just uh, a regular tradition? Like, like where do you draw that? <coughs> yeah, so, so first of all, divine revelation is not the same as something that a saint said necessarily, yeah. right? Divine revelation is the full uh, teaching of the apostles contained in the apostolic deposit, both written and oral. So one of the great examples of tradition is the liturgy. 
And liturgy, for example, the style and structure of the church's worship, which is not actually listed anywhere in the New Testament, for example, it's a it's a it's it's a it's a thing that the that the apostles gave to the church that is not in written form, but is in performative form. In other words, it's it's a performance. It's a um, it's a structure that the church did rather than what the church was concerned with writing a version of it and disseminating it because the church from the earliest days had a hierarchy. Orthodoxy is both hierarchical and decentralized at the same time. So in the early church, you had people doing the liturgy and the Bible is part of the liturgy. The actual context of the Bible is to be heard in liturgical celebrations. Why? Because that's how the Jews did it. The Jews read the texts. You could read them at home if you had David's scrolls. But actually, they're meant to be heard in the liturgical worship of the community of the church. So the Bible itself actually comes to be and to be codified in terms of the canon via the liturgical tradition of the church. A lot of people don't know this, but the decision of what books would go into the canon was many factors. One of those by the 5th and 6th century was looking at the liturgical texts and the daily readings of the church. So the daily readings, the lectionaries, had a key role in the determination of the canon of scripture. And that's even most Protestant scholars admit this. So liturgy is just one example of, quote, tradition of the church that is indispensable from knowing what books go in the Bible. Um, tradition includes things like, you know, lives of the saints, in that there's, there are stories in their lives inspire us to live rightly and to accept you know martyrdom or whatever uh tradition is in, includes things like um the decrees of the canons of the councils right so even though a canon of a council is not equivalent to divine revelation it's normative in the sense that you know the church has the authority to make these rulings and that's because jesus said i you know i've given you authority right he says to the church in matthew 16 matthew 18 he says, he that hears you, hears me. The church has the authority of Christ, and that means that they're going to develop a structure by which they can make canons and enforce them. So all of those things are part and parcel of tradition, but divine revelation is specific in that it is the theological teachings that the apostles taught from Christ, both in written and oral form. And that's that's the church fathers teach this, the New Testament teaches this, the Old Testament taught the same thing. There was there was divine uh, revelation contained in written and oral teaching. Okay. Okay. I think that answers the question pretty well. Thank you so much. Yes, sir. Good questions. All right, Jack. What's up, Jack? Thank you guys for those super chats. Uh, you have to hit unmute. People get, we're just having fun today, right? So, People are freaking out, thinking that I was having a meltdown. No, I always joke around on streams. It's not a meltdown. If you would hit like and share. Also, uh, there is the Streamlabs link for Super Chats. Jack? Hey, Jim. Um, I actually had one question I was waiting on, but something that you just mentioned there that I'll kind of interject here. Um, my background is like kind of, I grew up Baptist and then kind of went Presbyterian reformed and now I've, I did the same thing. <laughs> okay. Not that. Um, and a friend of mine just recently kind of turned, you was kind of intrigued me on to some of your work and some of the Orthodox stuff. Uh -huh. but you mentioned just now about, you know, the liturgy and that the Bible doesn't really talk about, um, how, church is supposed to be conducted but one thing i really come into to, i kind of define a lot of what i think about the church is really around first corinthians 14 where it says really specifically that two or three people two or three people should speak there should be a time for response as in critiquing it and kind of judging publicly judging the, the speaker's words you should be able to interrupt if one person is is speaking um and the conservative church seems to me says, you know, they love First Corinthians fourteen thirty four, where it says, let the woman keep silent in the church. But um, it seems like, you know, they just completely ignore it. In that same passage, it says, 
if you claim to be a religious or spiritual person, but you don't acknowledge that this is how church is supposed to be conducted, then you're not even recognized. Um, and it's a command specifically from Christ. Um, and so I can't anymore. I think that the entire environment of the church, of any church, Protestant, anywhere else, seems to me a very kind of almost cuckold environment because it's basically demeaning. I just to me, I see the value of in, in Christ's incarnation. And then when he says, I come as the firstborn of many brothers, I take that really seriously. I'm a brother to Christ. And so, you know, also when you see even in Jesus' teaching, he's always interacting. He's always dialoguing and debating with people. Um, and so to me, it just seems like the entire environment of, the, of a church where you have basically the paid professional religious elites who are basically telling everyone, shut up and sit down. I'm the only person that's qualified to speak about God and, you know, offer any kind of insights. To me, it's so contrary to really the entire, um, like, if you look at Jesus' life through kind of Jungian archetypes, like, who are the bad guys? Who are the true enemies of God? It definitely wasn't the government. It was the religious leaders. That's the people he hated and despised. So when I, so I, how do you reconcile kind of First Corinthians fourteen with, um, with the the liturgy? Sure. So first point is that the the intertestamental period, as we call it, is a unique time. So when we have the apostles going out and establishing the church. There's a lot of things going on that will not necessarily be normative for the entire history of the church. So, for example, uh, direct inspiration and sort of speaking in various languages and whatnot that we see at Pentecost. And Paul seems to be describing elements of this when he's talking about the charismatic gifts to the Corinthians. And so if the Holy Spirit inspires people to sort of prophesy or to say things, which we see in the book of Acts, right? So we see different uh, prophets and people inspired to sort of spontaneously do things in the book of Acts. So you're correct that that does occur. However, that does not mean that that mode of uh, worship or dialogue or debate or whatever that goes on in that early apostolic setting would be normative for the whole history of the church. So once the destruction of the temple occurs... And the apostles then spread the message and eventually the last apostle, John, dies. There's no longer going to be this kind of direct uh, uh, speaking of the Holy Spirit in that way. That doesn't mean there's not spiritual gifts and there's not discernment and miracles. The Orthodox Church believes in all those things. But what we believe is that even in the book of Acts, Paul, I mean, excuse me, Corinthians, Paul talks about there being a form of worship. But what I meant was not that the New Testament doesn't critique or talk about how roughly speaking, things should go. There's not an actual list and service structure. Okay. So in the old Testament, like, you know, obviously God, if you read the story of Nadab and Abihu in Leviticus, God's really concerned with how worship goes down. You know what I mean? You can't just do whatever you want because when Nadab and Abihu light strange fire, they get killed because they're doing it in an inappropriate, not structured way. God is not the other confusion we know. So, yeah, that, so hold on, so hold on. So last that. point, last point, right. Last point is that from the very first days of the church, we know that there is an ordered liturgical worship service because it's in the church fathers. They discuss this. For example, early, early on, Justin Martyr talks about the structure of the church service, that it is liturgical. Paul has, for example, references in his epistles to various liturgical uh, recitations and hymns that were being sung in the, in the first uh, century of the church. And when you go to pretty standard scholarship amongst Protestants and uh, evangelicals and even, uh, uh, even sort of like even Calvinist uh, his, the liturgists, they will admit that the earliest uh, services were liturgical worship. There's a great book by he Hugh Wybrew called uh, Orthodox Liturgy. And he himself is an Anglican and he's writing about the history of liturgical worship. There's another great book called Orthodox Worship. Contin <laughs> hold, hold on. Continuity. Last is the last point. Continuity with the synagogue, the temple, and the early church by Williams and Anstall. And what you see in these, in these texts is the admission that the first century of the church worshipped in a liturgical way, much like Jews worshipped at the synagogue and the temple. When Jesus went to worship, that's how he worshipped. So we actually know how the ancient Jews and the early church worshipped 
and it is the way that the Orthodox Church worships. Worships. And, you know, ultimately, you're, it's kind of your. I feel like you're. You're. It's. They're asking these religious elites are basically asking me though to give up what Christ promised me. I mean, even it says when when, when, when God gives it in First Corinthians fourteen, He says, "Or did the word of God come originally from you, or was it you only that it reached?" If anyone thinks that he himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge the things like which I write to you are commandments of the Lord. But if anyone is ignorant, let him be ignorant. The entire passage of First Corinthians 14, is, it, it really communicates that seems to be more normative, that even though he's actually kind of rebuking the Corinthians because they have diverged from the normal way that Christ interacted with people. So again, um, you just sort of, <clears throat> did you not hear, I'm not being rude to you, but <clears throat> you sort of repeated what I yeah, said you, as, you as quoted, if what I said. You quoted a bunch of books. I just can't, I don't know the reference that I have to go back and look and see what their specific debate, you know, arguments are. No, I didn't just but, quote books. I also pointed out that there's a established structure of liturgical worship that God has always had in place. And your response was to ignore all that and just restate the fact that, yeah, but Jesus dialogued with people. Yeah, but Jesus going out yeah, and doing minute. New Testament as well. I mean, it, Jesus you, going you, out Paul, and do, listen. Jesus Paul going out. And Peter, Paul and Peter. Paul confronted Peter in the in the congregation. So there okay. was a, there was an appropriate. You just assumed that everything that happened in the apostolic period is normative for the rest of the history of the church. Do you think we still have apostles? Right. Well, I mean, I, 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 I was just saying ultimately that you defer to the authority of the institutional structure. And Correct. So, kind of so like, do, I, do you understand the difference between the Pharisees were a false religious structure that were persecuting Christ? Jesus established a church structure. Yeah, I mean, I, so you're talking about, you mentioned that this is the liturgy, liturgy was kind of from the beginning of the ages. Then what's your thoughts on like the, you know, the, the communion, the Lord's table, was conducted as a, a meal, the agape. Yeah, it's not true. Yeah, none of that's true. Years. Yeah, it's not true. So why is it's it, not true? That that's pretty. Well, you don't think that the, it was there was no agape feast? I just didn't. No, the story. agape, the feast afterwards is not the Eucharistic liturgy. Paul talks about in Hebrews thirteen an altar which we eat from. Protestants don't believe in an altar that you eat from. No, but listen, in the didac, it's very clearly it's called a the didache. Meal. In all of the early church, it's very clearly a meal. Did you not hear what I said? The meal is not the same thing as the Eucharist. Yeah, they, they would have a feast after, sure. But that's how it was actually, that's how Jesus no, gave it no, to it's his not. disciples. You're just saying that. No, Jesus is doing a Eucharistic liturgy, which is the fulfillment of the temple and Levitical service. I mean, it might be wor worth it to go look and, and look up because it's really not disputed. With, for the first 150 years, it was... You, you just did, I didn't listen to anything that I said. Yeah, it, it is disputed. You're not even, you, do, you don't even know how to pronounce... The, you're not even pronouncing the text correct that you're citing. It's the Didache. And the Didache talks about the Eucharistic liturgy, and that's not the same thing as a feast that they have afterwards. Okay. All right, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, go back and listen to the replay because I, I do want to look up those those couple books that you mentioned. Okay. Um, the original question. Uh, uh, well, I'm going to have to move on because I'm going to start getting mad and then people are going to say that I'm being mean. So we're going to move on. Orthogone. Hello? Yes, sir. Uh -huh. You trying to shoot in a damn nail gun when you're on a live stream? Come on, man. Von Schlieff. If you already did your, your question, please don't come back immediately with another question. Let's We want to get through different people. Uh, uh, you hear me, Jake? Yep. Sweet. How you doing? Hey. Um, uh, so uh, the last couple of years, as I've um, kind of dived deeper into orthodoxy, um, you know, I've, I've started to become a lot less... Um, classical liberal and my thinking about things you know think about my rights and my constitution and like acting like those are these um divine things when they're just when they're not um but at the same time like when i'm talking to people about um certain issues um I don't know, the other week i was talking to someone about like the second amendment um 
as an example, and we were we were just having a discussion about it. Um, is there like you know like my my prior self would have you know again talked about like oh you know my right to this or my right to that, um, but again like my my thinking started to kind of change a bit about um, how I approach these issues. But like from a from an orthodox standpoint, is it just something that's it's kind of subjective? You can you know, have your own opinion on it. Just like, you know, is, on what? is it something you should, uh, I don't know, the second amendment. Let's, let's, let's use that as an example. Um, is it, you know, I don't I mean, I don't think the church, the church has like a, an official weighing one way or the other of what they think, but like, uh, I mean, just, well, I'm like, sorry. Well, divine revelation trumps the canons of the church. So, I mean, I'm not saying that the canons of the church are contrary to the, I mean, but I'm saying the divine revelation says you have a right to self-defense It's an exodus. Okay. Okay. Okay, so um, using that as the um, uh, the starting point, then that will kind of logically conclude that you know having ways to defend yourself would be justified, like from a, of a from a Christian and Orthodox. Yeah, you have to defend your family. I mean, go look up the Rocor uh, studies on uh, Rocor history of st- Rocor study on war. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I mean, imagine saying, "Oh, you're a man, but you can't defend your family." I mean, what? Yeah, yeah, and, <laughs> and obviously, you know, living in the the modern world, like uh, having a firearm is would be the best way to do that. So it makes sense that then you know you'd be able to to have one. Sure. Um, of course. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. All right. Well, I'll I'll look into that. That helps, Jay. Uh, yeah. I. Uh, yeah, just been thinking about that a lot. So, Good questions. Um, yeah, yeah, I definitely believe that the Bible teaches the other right self defense in Exodus. Duke of in in der, in Derta. Welcome everybody. If you want to support the stream, you can do so via the super chat function. You can also uh, support me via the links that are in the show description. You can get my philosophy course, uh, 12 lectures on the history of Western philosophy over at Richard Groves Autonomy Marketplace. You can get tickets to our live event with Jamie Kennedy in Los Angeles, July 6. There at the Eventbrite link. You can call in via Twitter spaces if you want to. You can have the floor for as long as you'd like. If you'd like to make an argument, if you'd like to ask a question, it's fine with me. You have to have it on your phone. It does not work on PC and you will be automatically muted because that's how it works. It's not me muting you. Please don't make me say unmute 20 times. If I give you, if I say your name and you come on, just talk. You can send super chats via Streamlabs. Everybody says, how can I send a super chat? Streamlabs, 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 Streamlabs link right there. This channel is not monetized. Are you there, dude? Yes, I'm there. Hey, what's up? How you doing? So- I'm doing great. How about you? Great. So my question to you is about the Oriental Orthodox Church, but first I would like to say a couple of things. Can Um, can you speak up? Oriental Orthodox, I can barely hear you. Okay, my bad. So I was was just saying, I've been listening to your videos and debates for a while now, Uh and uh, you got me basically interested in Christian theology, but yeah, it it was your videos uh, that helped me when I was losing faith and stuff, but anyways... Uh Okay. So my question, my question is, um, this is my fetism, my fetism, in your opinion, wrong? Not in your opinion, but in like Eastern Orthodoxy, is it wrong or no? Yeah, it's wrong if you interpret it in the way that the Orientals so-called do when they confuse nature and person and they don't allow any flexibility on the language. And that's why the later Cyril in the two letters to Six Census says what we say. And so uh, there's a section of John Damascus' uh, on the Orthodox faith where he gives our reading of the word miaphysis. So if you just mean that Christ is, <clears throat> if you just mean the hypostatic union, that's fine. We agree with that. But we don't think that Christ is a tertium quid, a third thing. So we've done probably 10 streams on this. You can go find the streams that I've done with David Real Medwhite, uh, David Erhan, look up those. There, there's countless of those. <clears throat> Okay, well, um, so let me let me put it like this. So if I say Christ is basically um, fully human and fully divine, but in one nature, in one united nature, is it heretical or no? Yeah, because nature has a specific uh, terminology, terminological use for us that the later councils specify that you have to distinguish nature and person. 
So if by one incarnate, quote, nature, you mean that it's a hypostatic union uh, and he's only one divine person, that's the decree of the fifth council that's attempting to reconcile you guys. If you mean that there's no longer the continuance of two natures and two natural with two, with two natural properties, that's heretical because did Christ, did his, did his divine nature die on the cross? I mean, it's really obvious that that's not true, right? It would lead to, mm-hmm. it would lead to absurd notions. Okay. Gotcha. Thank you for the answer. Yeah. Thank Go you. watch the, uh, discussions with me and David Airhan. We've, we've done a, a ton of these. It gets really complex. Chandler, what's up, dude? I'm mute. All right, moving on. If you can't unmute, I don't know what to tell you. I feel sorry for you. Stroke Guru. Guys, it automatically mutes you. Just unmute. Uh, here I am. Here I am. Hey. Okay, so St. Augustine has it that novum testamentum in vetere latet. Vetus testamentum in novo patet. The New Testament is hidden in the Old Testament. The Old Testament is revealed in the New Testament. This canon of interpretation is a standard part of the Catholic approach to the Bible. Okay. So that's from Catholicism.org. Yeah, I'm, I'm well aware of that quote. What about it? So earlier you were saying that Catholics do not teach that the Trinity is in the Old Testament, but this contradicts that. Right. So the guy was very specifically saying that the dogma of the Trinity is not taught in the New Testament, or excuse me, in the Old Testament, because he's talking about the formulation of the doctrine of the Trinity at Nicaea. By the way, do you, under, well, do, you under, do you understand that Augustine is also an Orthodox saint? So the fact that you quote a saint that's the same between Orthodox and Roman Catholics does not prove that that's Roman Catholic dogma. But they do teach that the Trinity is in the Old Testament. Yeah, and my point is that they contradict themselves because the teaching of Vatican II and natural theology contradicts that. Where does it say that in Vatican II? When it teaches on uh, natural theology and Nostra Aetate that Muslims and Jews and Christians worship the same God because of monotheism. They don't. The Old Testament teaches the Trinity. So all you're doing is pointing out contradictions in the Roman Catholic view. That's not really how I felt when you debated um, Trent Horn. I kind of feel like he smashed you on natural theology. No, but he didn't because everything that you're saying shows that you didn't even understand the debate. Well, that's what you're saying, but Whoa. that's not what a lot of people think. I don't care what a lot of people think, because a lot of people who are Roman Catholics in the comments think that Trent lost the debate, too. So, how, how do you understand that... people think that he won. Do you understand that won. what you just said contradicts Trent's whole argument? Are you that slow? Well, there's no reason to make ad hominem attacks there, little buddy. You don't have the Holy Spirit, little, by the way. Nobody who talks. So this like is you what he Holy goes. Spirit. This is what he goes through, right? So the so the church fathers don't have the Holy. Spirit. appeal to the. So crowd the Holy. Now. So they don't have they don't have the Holy Spirit when they call people. Trent uh, doesn't want to work with you, bro. He's a bro. Trent is a bro. I don't care. I don't care what you you have no argument. So I just showed that you were an idiot. I did make an argument. No, you didn't. You're using words no, you didn't. It's just word cell. So this is all these guys do is spew out this stupid Trent stuff. Smashed. You keep appealing to the audience, bro. Keep you just contradict. Audience. Do you understand that Trent teaches? Do not look at the man. Trent, he, he's not even. He can't even address the argument. He can't control himself because these so people when are loons. you got loons. your masters in CIA, like you don't think the CIA is aware that you got a masters in CIA? Like they're just gonna let you like expose them? A so masters in crazy. CIA. You got your masters. They're not even a coherent. To, see, thank you. Roman Catholics, keep it up. Keep it up. He didn't even realize that the dumb quote, the quote mind that he had is the opposite of what Trent argued in the debate. <laughs> Trent said that the Old Testament doesn't teach the Trinity, right? Illustrating my point, the Roman Catholic theology contradicts. So you see you see the absurdity and the ridiculousness of Roman Catholics. And, and then what does he do? He launches into this reformed uh or excuse me this uh roman catholic just spewing of nonsense i got a master's in cia 
I'm going to say that was so dumb that that had to be a troll. But then again, with Roman Catholics, you never know. You never could easily be a legit, just low IQ Roman Catholic. You can never know. Joseph. So we, we had a, uh, we had a poll at the beginning as to how many trolls would show up. And we said uh, two or under. So I'm going to say, was that, a, I mean, that was so dumb. I can't figure out if that was, did you get your degree in CIA? Is, imagine thinking that CIA is a degree. I got my degree in CIA. Wow. I kind of wish you would. What's up, Joseph? Go ahead. Hey, hey you got to have some uh, patience with the, the Catholic trads this week because it's been one sex scandal after another. It's just really imploding. And when when I try to engage these people on Twitter, their response is always, "Well, you guys allow you know divorce, remarriage, and contraception, so you know that's that's all they have." Yeah, all they have is what they think is a moral one up which is really signifying complete defeat. I mean, that guy, that guy didn't even realize that the very thing he's arguing is the opposite of Trent's argument in the debate. But yeah, great points, Joseph. Uh, was there anything else you wanted to say? No. Yeah, I mean, Roman Catholicism... Just, you know, it... You're cutting out, so I'm sorry. We'll move on. Yeah, I mean, that's all Roman Catholicism has left is this kind of stuff. And by the way, you notice the commonality between the people who, like, lose their mind over me and that guy and the soy so-called orthosphere. It's always the exact same, right? They just launch into this spewing of a bunch of nonsense. The Holy Spirit is not with him. Look at the man behind the curtain. Soul, what's up, dude? Yo, how's it going? Does that guy think that that's going to make Roman Catholicism appealing to anyone? Just how stupid and low IQ that was. Well, I'm here to expose you, Jay. Please do. I need to be exposed. It's time. Finally. The the giant pyramid butt sex scheme you've got going in your backyard. Got all the evidence. No, I'm just kidding. What's up? Um, So I I was actually in a talk with Father Peter Hears um, yesterday. And he was talking about, he seemed to be arguing against ecumenism on the basis that you really can't be good without being conjoined or communing with Christ in the body. Well, I mean, when you say be good, uh, ultimately for us, being good means partaking of theosis. But, I mean, you can be good in the sense of you can have virtues, right, without necessarily being in the Orthodox Church. Because... There, there, there's a the mode of Christ's presence or the Spirit's presence is different uh, in in different situations. So his presence in the world in an omnipresence way is different than the mode of his presence in the church. So I would just be more precise about the word "good" there, like qualify what do we mean "good," because there is a distinction between nature and grace. That's not just a Roman Catholic thing. Saint Gregory Palamas is very clear that there is a distinction between nature and grace. Um, that doesn't mean that we have the nature grace two tiered dialectical scheme that we find in Roman Catholicism, but it does mean that, as Paul says in Romans two, people can, in any religion or in the world, because the law is on their heart, the word is near you, the logos is in your heart. They can still do uh, uh, virtuous actions. Yeah. So me and my brother have been debating this, and he brought up you know, the law being written on your heart. And when I go to Romans 2 and 3, and I'm reading St. John of Chrysostom's homily on Romans 2 and 3, um, he, Paul seems to be making the argument that the Jews are condemned under the, the law of Moses and the Gentiles are condemned under the, the law of nature, the law written on your heart. Yeah, but he says when they do right, they are either accused or excused. Yeah, and see, when, Saint, when you go to the fathers on that, you get... What, I'm, what it seems to, they don't seem to be taking that as, oh, well, these people can somehow be like saved through these good No, 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 I didn't say saved. This. No, 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 I didn't say that. Okay. I said they can be accused or excused on the basis of the actions. 
not this the person themselves being saved. Okay, so when a pagan does something right, can he make, can he do a good act? Absolutely. I mean, human beings have a, let's say, uh, I mean, it would be a Calvinist view to think, for example, that, I'm not saying you're saying this, but to think, for example, that if a, uh, if a pagan mom loves her son, right, there is a created human energy of love that's proper to our nature, right? Where you can have love for your, for your siblings, right? And to think that everything that a pagan does is inherently sinful or automatically sinful is actually a, a, a Manichaean slash Calvinist view. It would mean that every action is sinful in some way. That's not true. Okay. So there's a distinction between nature and grace and you can do naturally virtuous actions. That's why, let me give you an example. Uh, in the homilies of St. Ambrose, he picks out the classical pagan virtues and he ties them into how Christians can understand and read them. So what I'm saying is that not everything in the classical uh, pagan vir world of virtues is false. That's why there, many of the church fathers will cite Aristotle and cite his uh, you know, text on virtue versus vice, right? That wouldn't be the, that wouldn't be the case if every action that you did was sinful in some way. That's Calvinism. Yeah, I don't think I would want to argue that every action is sinful in some way. It's just, he's throwing, I wish I had all his, like, PDF for um, what he was going through, because he had a bunch of quotes from the fathers. Um, one of the ones I do have a screenshot Wait, of. Wait, he who? St. Cyril what? of Jerusalem. He who? He writes, Hold on. He, he, what's, his, what's, his, what's his position? I don't understand. Is this a Calvinist, Roman Catholic? What's his position? Well, it's Father Peter here, so it's a... Oh, I'm Catholic sorry, I'm Catholic. sorry, I forgot you were talking about... He seems about. to be arguing this in the context of ecumenism, so he's then flipping and saying that the heterodox rights can't have grace in them on the basis of them not actually... Okay, being yeah, but, so, I, I'm not sure about his argument, but yeah. it, it's, it really doesn't matter about, like, just because you're... If, I mean, the natural virtues that are proper to human nature... They also come from Christ, Maximus says, and they do point us to Christ, but they're not equivalent to theosis, you see. So, um, could we argue that because there are, uh, I mean, I just don't understand the connection between whether there are virtues in the pagan world to the heterodox not having grace in the sacraments. I mean, I don't think that they do. Yeah. So Yes, so if you'll let me quote saint cyril real quick and sure. then i'll i'll get off but um so saint cyril and you can just explain what this what you think this quote means um saint cyril of jerusalem writes that the manner of piety or fear of god consists of these two of pious dogmas and of good deeds and neither the dogmas without good works that is life in christ are acceptable to, are acceptable to god nor does god accept works done without pious dogmas that is the truth of christ and yeah, but so could you just, where am I misunderstanding here? Because it does seem to be saying that like without pious dogmas, without the dogmas of the church. So again, so again, if you read out the last scene where St. Maximus talks about the mode of the presence of the spirit, it's different in the world as it is in the church. So God can accept and appreciate the virtues that men have that are natural virtues, that does not mean that they're being saved, that it's theosis. Those are things that move us and point us in the direction of theosis, but they're not theosis. So in one sense, they're acceptable in that God appreciates when a pagan mom loves her son, but that doesn't make her saved. Okay. So acceptance in one sense, not acceptance in another sense. Okay. All right, that's all I got, man. Dawkins. Yeah, I mean, St. Cyril Jerusalem is not doing an uh, excurse. Oh, St. Cyril Jerusalem is not doing an excursus on the status of classical virtues and being precise about he's saying to Christians, what matters? 
right? Hey, Jay, can you hear me? Yeah, just a second. So he's, expl- oh, okay. he's, he's explaining what matters ultimately for us. He's not explaining the speculative question about whether God in any sense uh, appreciates the love that a mom has for her son. So again, the natural virtues are not inherently sinful. They don't necessarily save us, but they are they orient us to grace and to Christ because our nature is not evil. Okay? We can't have a theology that says that all of our works before Christ are inherently evil. Okay, that's too black and white. There are natural virtues. Natural virtues don't grant us theosis and salvation, but they orient us in that direction. And that's pretty common amongst the church fathers. So if you find a quote of Cyril Jerusalem, I'm not knocking anybody for doing that, but I'm saying that Cyril is not talking about the topic of does God accept any virtuous actions at all? Yes, he does. Cornelius prays and God hears his prayers even before Cornelius knew about Christ and had a full out worked out theology in the church. Okay. But that doesn't mean that you're saved from natural. It doesn't mean you're saved or participating in theosis from natural virtues. And the reason we say that is that you cannot say that everyone's actions are sinful merely via nature. That would be a kind of Manichaean or Calvinist view. So again, there's a difference between, works that are proper to our nature that are virtuous and participating in theosis. There's a distinction between nature and grace. That's very clear in St. Gregory Palamas. What's up, man? Hey, what's up, bro? So I have a question about uh, the doctrine of assurance in orthodoxy. And um, so like, how does the, the uh, do you guys have a doctrine of assurance? Um, and how does this play into epistemic justification? Like, like, can you actually have assurance on the basis of, like, your justified true beliefs being true? Wait, I thought you were talking about assurance of salvation. That's different from philosophical justification and epistemology. Which one are you talking about? No, I'm, I'm saying, like, can you can you have, you know, philosophical epistemic justification uh, and that lead to assurance? Like, because, like, that doesn't this necessarily presuppose that if your worldview is true, then that means the Christian faith is true, right? Yeah, I thought you were talking about the evangelical concern with the doctrine of assurance of salvation. That's different from the question of epistemic justification assurance. But, like, is it really different, though? Or, like, is it like and from, from my... Uh, yeah, they're different. They're like totally a, different topics. The same thing? Like, if you can... No, they're not the same thing. They're totally different. Wouldn't that mean... No, that, they're not the same. You know, your own faith can you not hear me? No, they're different yeah. topics. So they're not the same thing. I'm, but I'm trying to figure out how they're not the same thing. Because one of them is about your individual situation in relationship to your relationship to Christ. The other one is about objective facts and logic and whether or not a worldview is coherent Two totally different things. Yes, but, but like, I'm, I'm not seeing that they're different things because like, it, like, like they're necessarily intrinsically tied together. Like the Christian faith and your own faith are, well, they might, are yeah, they might have a relate. Yeah. They might have a relation, but one of them is a question of your situation to the religion. The other one is a question of the factual truth or falsity of the religion. Two different things. Um, I, I just, I don't see that they're different things though. That's the thing. Because, um, from like my own understanding, like, I, I just think that they're inextricably tied together. Like, cause like, from, from in my personal situation can you, can you not under uh, listen hold on so i'm not saying they're not related anything can be related philosophically but the fact that they're related doesn't make them the same but how, like you're not explaining me how that does, it doesn't make them the same though so um is there a difference between my belief in, or excuse me, let, let's put it this way. My relationship to the Communist Party versus my knowledge of communist philosophy. Are those two things different? Um, yes, they are different. But they're also linked. Right, but they're different. Yeah, they are different. Okay. Uh, we're going to move on. I'm not trying to be mean to you. 
but I, I'm going to start getting mad. <laughs> so Alex Chromatic. Unmute. Uh, Jay Dyer? Yes, sir. Um, hey, man, I don't really hey. have anything to debate you on. I just wanted to let you know there's a YouTuber by the name Reckless Ben, and he spells reckless without a W, Reckless Ben, B-E-N, and he did, like, a 19-part expose on the 12 tribes where he actually, like, infiltrated the cult with spy glasses and spy watches. And he made, like, this really insane, like, expose on them. And I just wanted to let you know real quick that I thought... It's on a playlist that he has on his channel. I thought that would be a really dope uh, content for, like, uh, if you're going to do another, like, cult live stream. Okay. Yeah, I'll check that out. Um, Reckless Ben, you said? And, um, and also, I just wanted to say... Oh, she's my little guru. I met her on Instagram. Nice. I like that. <laughs> yeah, baby. Thank you for that. I'll check out Reckless Ben. Uh, let's see... Dark Armor Knight. What's up, dude? What's up, Jake? Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Perfect. All right. Um, it looks like I'm the second uh, Orthodox Christian from the Grimes, so I guess... You're I what? Speak up. I can't hear you. What? Can you hear me now? Yeah, go ahead. You're what? Uh, um, where I'm from, the region of Tigray, where my... Where my my, where my brand of orthodoxy comes from, there's this popular belief that we have the first remnants of human life. It's called, you heard of Lucy? You talking about that dumb ape theory of Lucy? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I was going to ask you about exegesis of Genesis. On the sixth day, it said that God created man, but then... After the day of rest on the seventh day, he restates himself. How does your view of evolution work with this sort of reading of Genesis? Uh, just to let you know, I'm not, a pro I'm not a promoter of the Lucy theory. Just to let you know. Okay. Yeah, I think that the two different sections of Genesis are talking about God's vantage point to human beings in two different relationships. So one is God as creator, and then the other is God's relationship to man. Uh, but I'm not sure why that's a problem or what that has to do with Lucy. What's up, Peter? Unmute. Hi, Jay. How's it going? Hey, man. How you been? I haven't talked to you in a while. Yeah, yeah. I'm good. How are you? Doing good. What's on your great, mind? Great, great. Um, I just had a question about the term Logi. Is that a term, like... Besides Saint Maximus, are there other fathers who use the term Logi in this in sort of the same way that he does, or is that kind of a unique thing to Saint Maximus? No, I mean it's the older version of the Logos Spermaticos, which predates mm. even. Uh, I mean that's in the Pre-Socratics. So the Logos Spermaticos is a Pre-Socratic doctrine. Um, right. We find it in Justin Martyr. We find it in the uh, Apologists of the first and second century. Some of whom, unfortunately, ended up heterodox. Um, Basil talks about the Logi, uh, John Damascus, I think mentions it, but Maximus is the first to really go in depth. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Good question. All right. So remember guys, it's open forum. You can have the floor. You can, um, make whatever arguments you want. Just please make arguments and make them coherent and pre please avoid the, uh, trad cat verbal diarrhea of nonsense. If you can, although it is pretty entertaining and I think it uh, helps to steer people away from the insanity of Tradcat world. But Cyprian, what's up? Hey, what's up? What's up? Yeah, so um, you know who Christian Wagner is? Oh, well, you know him. Um, there was like an unlisted stream he did on a Kyle's video. And um, there's a point in the stream where he makes fun of Kyle saying um, the essence derives uh, from the father, not the father from the essence. And then he just calls it nonsense. But I've read like St. Gregory's uh, triads and that just comes directly from like the last chapter. I'm just wondering, that's like, 
talking about um, the Ordo Theologiae, not like the principle by which the essence like derives itself from the Father, right? Sure. I mean, the order of theology is that we begin with a person of the Father, and uh, you know, it's pretty basic Nicene theology that the Father, the the Son, uh, is generated from the Father's nature. So he receives from the Father both his personhood and his essence, because he is the direct icon and image of the Father's nature. So right. you can't That's have okay. you can't have the yeah. generation of the Son without the hypostasis of the Son also being generated. It's both come from the Father, and this is this is stated in later councils that the existence of the of the Son and the existence of the Holy Spirit both derive their origin whole and entire from the person of the Father. Right, right. But that's um, because persons act, not natures. Natures exist in the mode of the persons who have those natures to act. Yep. Um. I, I think I have two more questions. Sure. So there are a lot of like Muslims and they'll always bring up like, oh, you know, Jesus, he was praying in, uh, to the father in the garden of Gethsemane. But like, you think like Jesus is like uh, omniscient, right? So like how would that work? And I usually think you just need like the human mind mm -hmm. and the divine mind in order to have like a, like a prayer relation. Right. Sure. And so that would, yeah, that would just answer it. Right? Well, I mean, the, 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 Trinity has always been a community and a communion from all eternity. So yeah. there's always an, uh, an exchange amongst the persons. And so the, the son has always been relating to and loving and reflecting the father always. And so when Jesus is giving us that example, it is not just proper to the human nature and the human mind. It is, he is setting an example, but he also has always had that derivative relationship from the father. He always came forth from the Father. He always loved the Father. And by the way, if actus purus is true in the Roman Catholic sense, then none of that makes any sense. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, okay, my last question is, um, this might be a little bit more like complicated, but it's on the uh, like the covenant of works, like reformed theology, the image of God, mm -hmm. how they'll say, like some of them will say like, okay, after the fall, you gain the sin nature, and then you lose the image of God, which means you just don't have the capacity to receive the Spirit. And so it's like a purely external thing when you're, like, uh, you know, justified, sanctified, etc., right? Um, and, like, Perry Robinson makes the argument that, like, that's Pelagian, right? Because... It is Pelagian. It is Pelagian. Sort of, like, collapse the nature-grace distinction, right? It, yeah, it is Pelagian, correct. Yeah. It's yeah. the Pelagian um, view of prelapsarian man, Correct. Yeah, and that just comes from, like, some sort of, like, categorical, like, monergism, right? Basically. Which thing? The confusing of, na the confusing of nature and person comes from the default acceptance of Augustinian theology. So, yeah, Augustinian yeah. theology confuses nature and person in the triad. That gets confused in a human anthropology and in soteriology. So, Reformed theology is kind of defaulted to adopting all of that. Oh, I mean more like the, um, what is it, the total depravity, like losing any like capacity to like bring in the spirit outside of something like external to us. Sure, that's but I, right, yeah. that's correct. But I'm just saying that all of these kind of flow out of the triadic mistake. So the, the mistake in the triad is what leads to all the way down to the errors in soteriology where they believe in monergism because the nat your nature has to be completely overcome because you're inherently in rebellion against God. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's like the monoenergism, like Correct. particular, like, yeah. Okay, um, that's it. I don't really have anything else to ask. Yeah, great, great points. And I mean, yeah, if you think about it, the covenant of works makes no sense because it's basically also uh, amounting to Jesus coming and meriting created grace. And so that means that ultimately Reformed theology is just presenting another form of Created grace, which is what Roman Catholicism officially teaches. Jerome. You got to hit unmute, bro. Hey, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Hey, uh, I'm just wondering about uh, when debating with uh, people from an atheist worldview. Um, you know, we're going to try to point them towards Christianity or whatever, because if you just try to convince them of a God, you know, it's not really good enough most of the time. Well, there's no such thing as generic God. It doesn't exist. 
Say that again. There's no such thing as generic God. It doesn't exist. There's no, right, there's no such exactly thing my, as that. That's exactly my point. So you that, can't no, that's really natural that. theology, by the way. Right. So you can't really do that. But one thing I have hard time with these conversations is the, uh, the discussion of creation itself, because I feel like from an atheist worldview, it's so hard to get past that everything else is impossible to uh, convince them of. What are your thoughts on that? You're saying how to convince an atheist, like, how would I argue that there is a doctrine of creation to an atheist? Yeah, because it's so hard for them to get past because of their worldview that that part of it, you can't even get past that part of it. And if you can't get past that part, how do you get past any other part? Yeah, so that's why presuppositionalism and tag is so important because that they're, they've got the cart before the horse. It's like, whoa, 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 let's, let's, let's rewind here. Uh, you're going to tell me about, you know, the beginning of the universe and all this stuff when I don't even think that you can give an account for knowledge itself. You see, that's a much more. So in other words, you got to rather than arguing with them over creation, uh, I'm going to argue with them over the presuppositions of their worldview. And I'm not going to grant that they can even make claims about the world or history at all. Sure. But let's say they get that far and they say, OK, I. I will I will use your uh, methodology. I'll go the other sort of the other direction than I'm used to. If we're trying to get them convinced of Christianity, especially Orthodox Christianity, it's not so much that there's a, a God that we're trying to convince them of. It's the Christian worldview, but the story of creation at mm -hmm. the very beginning uh, of Genesis. Mm -hmm. I have a hard time getting them past that. Not just me, but I see that online all the time. Like that's the story specifically is historical, but they can't even get past that part, even if they're trying to believe that there's a God. Well, I mean, there's different ways you could take that line of argumentation, but I mean, why, why is what they think is the case a better explanation? To me, it seems even more ridiculous. Yeah, it, it's, it's not a better explanation, but from their worldview, they, they're not just going to be like, oh, well, Yours is just better. Okay, well, just, let's put it let's put it this I way. So, like, you know. right? I mean, there's a there is a process to this, even though I mean, even though the worldview itself is a whole system, most people don't immediately adopt the whole worldview in their chronological existential experience. That's true. So, it's true that uh, you know a person might first begin to think maybe there's a god and maybe there's design, maybe there's purpose. Um, and they're not necessarily adopting the whole Christian system. But, but that, by the way, doesn't make natural theology too, true because they're because they're going through this process piecemeal. That doesn't make natural theology the case as if those things are true because a person chronologically piecemeal goes through that. That has nothing to do with what's uh, objectively the case. That's confusing your own temporal discovery of things with the fact that this is objectively the case. I know you're not saying that, but so. Yeah, we might have to, uh, you know, work through a lot of different topics over a long time. In fact, it took me a long time before I decided that the theistic evolution narrative made no sense, right? I, I held off on that question until I spent a good time reading about it and hearing the various positions and argument. So, yeah, it's true that not everybody's going to overnight accept it. So, But I wouldn't worry too much about that because... I think over time, people, if they're honest and sincere, they're going to come to the right conclusions. They're, they're, they're going to see the problems in the evolutionary narrative. So I wouldn't worry too much about um, trying to get them to immediately accept the entire worldview. It's enough, I think, to critique their basic presuppositions and get them understanding that their materialistic atheist narrative can't even do anything. It can't give an account for ethics, knowledge, metaphysics. You can't even make sentences in that worldview if they were consistent. So if you can get them thinking that, don't worry too much about also trying to convince them immediately the doctrine of creation. That'll come down the road. Um, but if you're debating somebody specifically on the doctrine of creation, there are philosophical arguments that you can present, like pointing out the, you know, like if, 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 the universe has always just been here, right? Then there's not really an, any good account for why there's change or why there's movement at all. So you could utilize some kinds of arguments like that. Um, I mean, there, there are ways you can go about uh, 
critiquing. It just depends on specifically what their position is. Like, are they saying that, no, it's the Big Bang? Are they saying, no, it's uh, the universe was is eternal? Or there's different philosophical routes you can take to critique that. Um, and, you know, humans, for example, happen to be constituted such that they learn and experience things in beginning, middle, middle and end. So there is this structure to how we learn things, beginning, middle, and end. But if, for example, the universe has always forever been here, then there's not actually a basis to believe in the transcendental uh, 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 presupposition of time, right? Which is beginning, which is movement from past, present, future, beginning, middle, end. You see how there's a there's a structure there, and even in language, for example, every linguistic communication is it moves from beginning middle and end and you can show this philosophically there's actually some really good essays that show the uh presuppositions the transcendental categories necessary for language to be possible and one of those is the movement a movement in time from beginning middle to end every conversation that's meaningful has a beginning a middle and an end in fact i think it's even uh alistair mcintyre the famous virtue ethicist he has a whole uh, essay on the patterns of every every linguistic communication event okay beginning middle and end so if there is no beginning middle and end ever then we don't really have a basis to believe in beginning middle and end in our conversations and if our conversations don't have beginning middle and end then everything is kind of uh, illusory the movement the change is illusory you see and some eastern philosophies go in that direction but maybe they believe in the big bang that's a different course of critique that you could do. I mean, it just depends on the atheist. You, you need to know exactly what kind of an atheist thing they're presenting, I think, to really critique it good. Right. Well, yeah, these are just my uh, moron friends. So it's it's really not um, that difficult. Using your using tag and other uh, arguments, uh, I've got them to like be on the ropes with their atheist mm. worldview, but it's the actual creation story itself that they always well that's yeah that's look default to this and say well that can't i can't believe anything else there because that can't be true that's i know it's not really valid argument from their side well that's that's the thing is right so i mean creation is not a doctrine of natural theology creation is according to hebrews a doctrine of divine revelation creation ex nihilo is we know that not by speculation deduction but by divine revelation right yeah yeah so, yeah, I mean, it's it's like St. Justin Popovich says, like, you can't believe these things and truly know these things without repentance because they're not actually ultimately intellectual problems. You can point out the intellectual problems and dilemmas, but just knowing the problems aren't actually enough to get people to change or to get them to believe. Like, they have to repent. So, the, so the, this is a radical position here that a lot of people don't understand. They don't believe like man's problem is not intellectual. It's moral. Yep. Anyway, hopefully that's helpful, but it really just, you just gotta, yeah, just gotta ask a lot of questions to get the atheist guy to like lay out exactly what his worldview is. And usually they'll just say a bunch of ridiculous contradictory nonsense. Uh, I got, let me go TT put a little music on. Uh, we'll keep going here because we haven't even gone two hours yet, but, uh, let me use the the little girl's room and I'll be right back.
I had to go to the little girl's room. Hey, go TT. <laughs> Jamie's in there grinding up the coffee for me. What's up? We got, uh, still got 400 people. We got up to like 500. We still got uh, about 400 over here. So, uh, let's see. We got requests. Zach. Next up. What's up, Zach? Hey, Jake, can you hear me? Yeah. Hey, my, uh, so my question, so I just came out of the Protestant world and like your, your videos and all that has been super helpful to leading me to orthodoxy. So I just want to say thank you for that. I'm becoming more and more convinced of it every day. But my cool. question is, what advice would you, would you have for continuing to interact with people in those heterodox worlds, right? Because the more that I become convinced of orthodoxy, the more I realize that they're they're mutually exclusive right these these are two different religions and so with people i care about obviously i, I don't i mean i care about the truth but like how what advice would you give on how to like relate to them and have conversations with them and yeah i would say that um tailor your discussions to the people because you know them well uh don't try to debate with your parents or your family members or you're never going to convince like a parent uh through argumentation and logic uh try to influence them in subtle ways. Um, if it's your compatriots, people your age, and you guys like to debate, then have at it, right? But just note, note the relation that you have to the individual before trying to, you know, engage at a, a confrontational level or whatever. If, you're, if it's your bros, you know, they can handle that. Um, but I would also say that although it's natural for us as we work through these issues to want to debate them a lot, um, don't go too heavy into trying to debate them until you spend a good amount of time in catechesis and learning the theology for a few years. And then, you know, you'll be a little more equipped because you, you need to kind of go through the process of, you know, living this and whatnot and being in the church and being in the liturgy for a while. Because at first, um, you're going to be, you know, super zealous and you're going to be like, you know, a new convert with that new convert zeal, but yeah, don't pre up your mom. Somebody said in the chat. Exactly. Yeah, it's not, it's not going to be, it's not going to get you anywhere. Um, and then you're going to encounter issues, right? You're going to start having your pr problems in the Orthodox church. You're going to have struggles with people. You're going to have issues with, you know, priests, maybe, you know, who, who knows, but, uh, take your time and be really slow about it is what I would say, believe it or not. Uh, that's my advice to that question, but, so, uh, soul, did you want to make another comment? By the way, I wasn't trying to be rude. I was just, I was, uh, frustrated trying to express what I was trying to say. I wasn't mad at you. Oh, you're fine, man. No, I didn't take it. I didn't take it in a bad way at all. Um, the guy brought up evolution to you a second ago and I've had a thought on, um, and I wanted to run it past you. So, Saul, I think it's Saul Kripke who does the whole water is H2O thing. Are you familiar with like the philos I'm not familiar with like philosophical responses to that and stuff. So I don't know like a lot about Kripke. I mean, uh, Father Deacon would be a better person who, I mean, he studied Saul Kripke pretty in detail, but um, so no, I don't know about this argument. Okay. Well, I was just going to, well, pretty much the gist of it is he says water is H2O and then he uses the law of identity to essentially say in a modal sense Thank that you. that's true across all possible worlds. Um, so if there is water in some other possible world, right, then it's H2O. And that's because you find that out since you find that out through observation. You don't know that a priori that water is H2O. Uh -huh. Well, this sounds uh, like the, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know. I didn't know Kripke made this argument, but I've made the argument about, you know, just I, I was argue I, I've argued against multiverse on the basis of the law of identity. Yeah, I'm not really talking about a multiverse, though. I'm just talking about the notion. I'm just using possible world semantics to talk about. I know that you're not saying, logic, I know right? you're not talking I, about multiverse. I'm just saying that I'm okay. familiar with kind of what you're saying because of the argument I've used against the multiverse. Yeah. Okay, so I, I was wondering if you think that you can flip this onto evolution and say that like something like a category like a dog, right, is... You don't know everything about a dog and dogs until you've ex experienced many particulars amongst the community of dogs, right? And so it seems like you could almost use this to argue that 
categories in general are the same across possible worlds. Does that does that make sense? Yeah, I think that when atheists, evolutionary materialist type people deny any kind of actual existing uh, classes of things, that this would amount to some form of denying some kind of law of identity, right? I think so. Is that okay. what you're saying? Yep, that's exactly. Yeah, right no, I, I think I think you'd absolutely Thanks, absolutely make that argument. I think you know, and and other s- arguments similar to that kind of hinge on um, nominalism. I mean, atheism is pretty much 99.9% committed to nominalism. And I mean, it's kind of a similar type of argument. It's not law of identity, but it's saying, well, there's no classes of things. If there's no universals, then you're already stuck basically in eventually the destruction of knowledge as a whole. So yeah, I think you could definitely go that route. All right. Sweet. Yeah. Good point. Uh, Peter, what's up? You want to make, make another comment? All right, can you hear me again? Yeah. Cool. Uh, are you still taking like geopolitical type questions today? Sure. Um, it's funny. This was I, this is actually something I was hanging out with my former priest's son, who's like moderately red pilled, you could say, like on the scale of one to ten, like one being the least, ten being the most. He's like a six or seven, and he was asking me like from the perspective of like you know Klaus and company, why bugs like why you know why would why specifically i i I mean i i I get and he gets like why you know meat would be banned you know like the rationale from their perspective but why but but like why bugs so one solution to that is that a lot of these celebrities and weirdos uh have already put a lot of money into the bug food companies so there's a, a gaming the market kind of racket involved in this Um, and then more speculatively, I think we could say it's also kind of like a middle finger to the, to the working classes and to the poor that, Mm -hmm. you know, you know, it's like, it's like, uh, temple of doom when they get to the Indian village and right. And, and they're like, they're trying to give, uh, Willie Scott, a bunch of plate of bugs. And it's like, uh, it's rubbing your face in it kind of thing. Okay. Yeah. Cause I knew about, um, you know, all the big time, like celebrity investments in things like, you know, like beyond meat, impossible right. meat, those exactly. things, but I wasn't, but I, those are more like, you know, soy, you know, plant seed oil slop as opposed to like from actual insects. Yeah. And I mean, there could be also, you know, the carcinogen, carcinogen, carcinogen effect, right? Definitely. Which could relate to other more uh, malicious, nefarious motives. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thanks. Yeah, good question. Uh, Let's see. Let's find somebody who has not come on yet today. Moy the Boy Tech. What's up, dude? You just hit unmute. Hello, hello. Can you hear hey. me good? Yeah, what's up? Hey, Jay. Good to speak to you for the first time. Hey. I actually just downloaded Twitter to uh, ask you this this question uh, that I've, I've had for a Uh-oh. really long time. Here we go. So, Uh-oh. Um, yeah, I know. Whoops. Downloaded Twitter. Um, so, I know that us as Christians, we default to morality by go- going to God. You know, he's the one that claims for morality. But... When I'm talking to my more uh, secular, agnostic, and atheist friends, there's a difficulty to see good versus evil. So it might be a little bit of a broad, broad question, but like, what's uh, is there any way uh, that you explain like how we can clearly see good versus evil? Like, I have some radical ways, but they're they're a little bit like like obvious obvious examples. Like that'd be crazy if they uh, agreed to it. But like, is there any uh, discourses or explanations that you give to like why we can pretty much be certain for good and evil in the world, or what do you uh, what, what's your explanation on that? How do you see it? I mean, good seems to me to be the most fundamental presuppositional category necessary, right? The good. If there's no such thing as the good, then really all value judgments are impossible. They, they don't mean anything. So there's got to be some kind of objective good in a philosophical sense 
not just to have uh, ethics, but to make truth claims. I mean, to say that one thing is true versus not true or versus the false necessarily relates to the good because it means there's a, sort of an assumption there that we ought to choose the true versus the false. So, I mean, the good, like the true, these are such fundamentally absolutely necessary, not just ethical, but epistemological and metaphysical categories that, again, all meaningful communication and human predication would be impossible. And I say impossible in the sense of being coherent, being meaningful, being justified, if there was no such thing as the good. I mean, that to me is like, that's like a super... That's a very awesome way to put it. Because, yeah, everything goes back to like, hey, let's find truth. Let's find something that's actually practical. Well, I mean, think about all science. All science is predicated on the search for uh, verifiable, correct theories and data versus unverifiable false data. That's the true versus the false. That's choosing the right one versus the wrong one. So you can't actually separate science from value judgments as much as they think that they can. That is, that's a fantastic way to explain it. I I love it. I'm going to take a note on it. And I have a second last question for you. Okay. So I come from a polygamous Mormon background, right? And I disagree. Obviously, I disagree with their polygamist uh, uh, discussions. But, you know, they usually default to like, oh, well, David and Solomon had a bunch of cute concubines. So why can't I, as a man of God, also have them? How do you respond to these things? Because like, I mean, polygamy, polygamy doesn't, I mean, first of all, like, yeah, you got to be a good man, which many men aren't. And this was David and Solomon. Like, what's your explanation for that? I think that in the Old Old Testament period, uh, God tolerated a lot of things uh, in terms of morals and ethics that he eventually wanted to kind of pedagogically, gradually lead people to not do anymore. So, uh, you know, in, uh, slavery, uh, you know, the sort of barbaric things that we see that are in t- at times t- tolerated, you know, that many of the church fathers argue that that was really God sort of gradually drawing man back to the calling that is more like what we see in Genesis. And so Jesus's uh, law that he lays down is the restorative Eden law, right? So he's basically saying, let's, let's go back to this. This is going to be the norm for the church because that's what I originally had intended for uh, Adam and Eve in the garden. So the church is uh, the new Eden. It's the restored Eden, so to speak. Um, and that's why, you know, you have things that are tolerated, but are not the ideal situation. So it's true. I mean, there's other things, too, that, you know, were tolerated in the Old Testament period, like slavery, that we don't typically think are normative for the New Testament period. Yeah, it, it did, um, you know, not condoning it, but it, it did make sense back then because it was a completely... Uh, brutal uh animalistic world where sure. you know it was death or survival right so like and everybody didn't know how to read most people so it was more it wasn't like how movies make it seem it was more like servants you know you did what the master said correct right? yeah so like, obviously that's a from a, in a more uneducated world so that's how you you know used yeah. word pedagogically started progressing to a more civilized state right exactly so that's, correct that's, uh, all right all right that goes analogous to polygamy like David and Solomon, they had concubines, you know, God allowed it, but he, he's not promoting it to, to, uh, all these, uh, horny men, you know, that are just making a mess out of, out of families out here. Yeah. And I mean, again, there's other institutions in the ancient world like that, uh, like the slave trade that, you know, couldn't immediately be completely revolutionized. Right. And so I think that that's why there's a gradual pedagogical, uh, leading of man to a higher calling, so to speak. E Monarca, what's up? Hello. Yep. Yeah. So I had um I wanted to talk about the Muslims worshiping the same God from okay. the Roman Catholic. Sure. Yeah. So how would you um differ? So in Acts seventeen, when Paul says that at one on one of their altars they they worship God without honor. 
they worship God, even though they don't know about him. Right. That doesn't prove that doesn't prove natural theology, though, in the Roman Catholic sense, because Paul says that in one sense, you know, the true God, but in another sense, you don't know him. So the statue that he's pointing to is the one that they don't know. And the irony is that you're that's the one that's the true God, the one that you don't know. So it's actually an argument against natural theology. And you'll notice in that chapter, Paul doesn't say anything like what a Roman Catholic proponent of natural theology would do. He doesn't say, look, we all have a common idea of God. We all believe in one ultimate uh, source. We all believe in the teleological argument, the cosmological argument. There's nothing in that chapter or in Romans 1 at all like the way that Roman Catholics go about doing their so-called natural theological apologetic. Paul preaches the resurrection and he says, the word Jesus is near your hearts. The word is near your hearts. How is that? That's not possible in Roman Catholic natural theology. The logos, the word Jesus is not near anybody's hearts in the Roman Catholic system. In fact, the Roman Catholic system doesn't believe in the heart, the noose, the orthodox system does believe in the heart or the noose. It's a specifically orthodox doctrine. So everything in that passage is completely orthodox and absolutely not Roman Catholic natural theology. Yeah, so um, you wouldn't, the statement when it says that the Muslims worship... Um, the, Hold I on. Guess, Hold on. Know, like do, do, what do we worship? Do we worship an absolutely simple Unitarian thing? Or do we worship the Trinity? Who is God? Yeah. No, who, I, no I I'm asking you. Who is it? Trinitarian. Okay, right. No. So it is not. So let's say between Basil and Eunomius, do they worship the same God? I don't know that much about church history. Okay, so Eunomius is a radical Unitarian Arian. Do they worship the same God yeah. according to Basil? I don't know. I don't know what Basil said about that. Okay, so he I'm wrote just, a yeah. famous book against the Eunomians. So uh, no, the Cappadocians yeah. fight their whole life against Eunomians. Yeah. Okay. Eunomianism is pretty similar to Islam. Okay. So yeah. would we argue that Basil and Eunomius believe in the same God because they both believe in monotheism? Of course not. Yeah. Ergo, yeah. between a Muslim and an Orthodox person, there's no common God. Yeah, but I'm taking the perspective from Paul says like this God whom you worship without knowing is the one I'm telling you about. And they were polytheists. You know, they had crazy gods. Did, you, uh, did to, you not hear what I said? He's saying the one that you don't know is the true God. You don't know him. Yeah. But it says that he, they worship him. They have a statue to an unknown God, and the pagans did this just in case. It doesn't mean that they know God. Yeah. They do not have yeah, a saving I mean, knowledge of God. I, know, I was just mostly saying that it's like Paul, for polytheists, he even says that they worship the one God that we... um. That Paul worship. Did you not hear what I said? No, I, I see what you're saying. It's no, you didn't. They don't know anything about him. They like lie about him and no. all that. What's the name of the God? Of the Old Testament? No, in the ta the passage with the statue. The unknown, the unknown God. Okay. So is he known? No. Okay, so then they don't it's, worship the same God as Paul. Yeah, but Paul is saying that they worship him without knowing. So it's like their knowledge is faulty, just like in Islam, but they still worship him. No. Mm -mm. So again, yeah, you could say in a sense they do, in a sense they don't. But the point of the passage is that you don't know the true God, but he's near you, yeah. even in your hearts. And you're saying that um, Vatican II makes it out to be like they do know all they do don't do know him. Vatican II says the Muslims together with us worship the one true God. Yeah, and I don't they see don't. That's that di different from what Paul's saying when he says you worship this God. I mean, I just illustrated this to you with Basil and the Eunomians. Yeah. Did you not understand it? No, I understand it because no, they're, you didn't. They're, li they're lying about they, they no. don't know him. And no. They're lying about his nature. Not it's not. Look, so in one sense, there's a knowledge and another sense there's not, right? So yeah. if I, if I say, uh, if I say, um, let's say somebody doesn't know me, but they've heard about me, right? Or yeah. they, they know that there's a guy on the internet who makes these arguments, right? And they might know a few things about me. 
right? Does that mean that they know me? No, no. I, I'm also right. I'm not arguing that they know they know God because it's true, they're really far from that, you know. But um, mostly just about so the worship you're, it's part. equivalent. Like, uh, well, how do you worship something you don't know? I mean, Paul said that they were worshiping something that they don't know. You know, do you, again, know. you don't understand that's a use of irony, right? So he's saying that you have a statue to an unknown God, and he's saying, ironically, that's the one I'm telling you is the true God. Yeah. Yeah, I know. And, okay. uh, no, you don't, not because you're not listening to what I said. So you're basically telling me that Eunomius and Basil worship the same God. I'm, I don't know about that specific situation. You don't understand the analogy to what, what I'm... to the, the to. To this, yeah, yeah, but I'm, I'm uh, I see what you're saying because they have a completely different idea of God that they're appealing to. Okay, but, so some commonalities don't equate to same referent, right? So let's take monotheism. For an Orthodox Christian, monotheism refers to the Trinity. Okay, yeah. for a Muslim, monotheism is exclusive and not Trinitarian. So the fact that they both have the same referent monotheism does not equate to in any way the same God or the same referent because there's some overlap because they're mutually exclusive categories and systems. Does that yeah. make sense? I agree that it's not like um, the knowledge of God isn't there, but I'm just trying to draw a parallel, you know, where it says you, you worship him without knowing in, uh, in Acts 17. Yeah, and you're saying that, that they do know him. The point of the passage is that you don't know him. Yeah, but it also says that they worship him. That, I mean, <laughs> but yeah, they I mean, worship what they don't know. So it, you keep saying this point, it doesn't matter. That doesn't equate to Orthodox and Muslims having the same God. Do you not see why? No, I, I understand that there's like in one way they worship him, but in another way they're completely wrong. Um, and I, I, I don't think that... Uh, Vatican II says anywhere that they know all about him or that they're fine because... Muslims and Christians do not worship the same God at all because of... You understand, you're you're making a mistake because you think that because there's some overlap, it's the same referent. When it doesn't matter, if we, if we had... If, if a Muslim believed in nine out of ten attributes of God that we do, and one of those attributes is that God is triune... That's enough to make it mutually exclusive. They're not the same. So how would you differ um, that from the Greeks having, you know, hundreds of gods and Paul saying that they, they worship um, as this God that he's trying to tell them about? It doesn't matter whether it's polytheism or Unitarianism. Yeah, but Paul uses the claim that they have like mutual worship. You worship him. I worship, you know. Um, it's not, it doesn't matter. It's not acceptable worship, right? Yeah. And the Vatican II doesn't say true worship. It just says. No, like actually worship. it does. It says that uh, Hindus also love God. Yeah, but they don't say it's true. It just. It says Hindus they, love God. It says that Hindus have a, an acceptance with God based on their Hindu faith. It says that in Nostra Aetate. Yeah. And in a sense. You just keep they, saying, yeah. And no, they don't. There's only uh, honestly, Hinduism isn't too far from what the Greeks were doing. And this is Correct. what Paul said to the Greeks that they were worshiping him, but you don't know about him. You can't worship what you don't know. The point of the passage is that you're blinded and it's irony. You don't understand that. You just keep going back to the word worship as if that means that they know him and they worship the same God as us. They don't. No, no, I, no, I, I don't think that they know him. Um, I just think that they, then the worship doesn't do anything. That's the point. Yeah. I, I mean, you, you could say like the worship, I, I don't know how God sees their worship in what sense at all, but... But we do know that because of the example that I gave with the Unitarians. It doesn't matter whether it's monotheism or polytheism. It doesn't matter because the only acceptable worship is of the triune God. You can't yeah. worship. Listen, let me give you an illustration of, of what I'm trying to say. If I say, I believe in one God, and you say, well, I also believe in one God. And let's say your God is the Trinity. My God is the one God that is Satan. We both worship one God. D do we then worship the same God? Uh, obviously not. Yeah. There you go. Term, but... 
Yeah, and I'm so sure. now you're just going to say, I see what you're saying, then repeat your same point for the 20th time. No, I won't repeat it anymore because, um, I mean, you pretty explain, explained your, you know, explained your position. As far so as if I, I did an, Ill, so let's say, let's say you're the guy that has the one God that's Satan. Okay. Uh, and I'm the one God that's the Trinity and we're having a dialogue and I say, I'm going to illustrate to you in your theism that your system is dumb. And I say, this one God that you call Satan, that is Jesus, not Satan. And you worship him without knowing him. What you're grasping after for Satan is actually fulfilled in Christ. That is what Paul's doing to the, to the polytheists. Okay. Do you see? Yeah, you're, I, you I, are I, grasping for Jesus because you want an ultimate power as a Satanist. Even though it's worshiping Satan, you're ultimately grasping for Jesus without knowing it. You don't know Jesus. That is what Paul's doing. He is not saying that we all worship the same God because there's common terms. All of natural theology is built on the word concept fallacy that because there's common terms, we all worship the same referent. It's a very simple, silly mistake. Yeah, I would just distinguish worship from belief and... Um... What? Or, or, I, whatever. Or it doesn't yeah, matter. Whatever. Saving worship knowledge. It doesn't matter, man. Whatever. All right, I, I'm getting. Know. I'm getting frustrated. I apologize. I'm not mad at you. It's just like, can people not understand this? It's not that hard. Let's let's give an easier example. A Mormon says, "I believe in Jesus. I believe in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I believe the same thing as you, Orthodox Trinitarian." No, you don't. Just because you have the same words does not mean the referent is the same. It's no different than the mistake when people say the Old Testament God is Elohim. The Canaanites said El. Therefore, the Old Testament God is a Canaanite God. This is a really simple, silly mistake. It's a grammatical mistake. Word concept fallacy. Word referent. The same word can refer to different things. Likewise, in theology, you can't have seven of God's attributes and throw out three of them, right? And say it's the same referent. This is, this is not that difficult. People, can you understand? Okay. Let's say that there's, let's say that there's 10 key attributes of God, just for the sake of argument. And all of those attributes are necessary such that I can't deny one of the divine attributes and still have the same God a referent. For example, I believe in all of God's attributes, but not omniscience. Okay. If you deny omniscience, then it's no longer the same God. It doesn't matter that you have nine of the 10 attributes. Okay. It doesn't matter. There's no scale of, well, I got 90% of God's attributes. So I have a 90% God. Do you see how dumb this is? It's a system, mutually exclusive system, such that the system of Islam that is Unitarian does not overlap with the system of Orthodox Trinitarianism. They're mutually exclusive systems. It doesn't matter that there are overlaps. You believe in God's omniscience, Trinitarian. I believe in God's omniscience as a Muslim. Therefore, it's the same God. No, it isn't. Any more than Basil's Trinitarian God is the same God as Eunomius's Unitarian God, which also uses the words Father, Son, and Spirit. Guys, this is very simple. All of natural theology is built on this. How can you not see that this is a problem? This is silly. It does not matter if there's the same words. What matters is the referent, not the words. Don't you think that when we translate the Bible into some other language, is it suddenly a different God because it's a different word? Of course not. The Aluit word for Trinity. It doesn't matter what that word is because it's the referent that matters. As a Trinitarian, when I reference the Trinity with the word T-R-I-N-I-T-Y, it's the same thing that the Aluit, when he says Uga, whatever, is referencing the Trinity. The words can change. 
The referent doesn't. It's simple grammatical stuff. And so many people. Imagine the stupid bait and switch that the Roman Catholic system is built on this bait and switch in Vatican II and Nostra Aetate. And by the way, that guy's like, no, it doesn't say that. It doesn't say that. Yes, it does say that. Let's get Vatican II out. Let's see what it says. Does the Roman Catholic Church believe with Hindus that Hindus worship and love the same God that we do? Yes. And the Muslims? Yes. Nostra Aetate, paragraphs 2 and 3. The church has reverence for the Muslims. They worship, quote, capital G, God. This is the basis of Roman Catholic natural theology and ecumenism with the Muslims. Clear as day. Well, that's your interpretation. The, this is supposed to be the interpretation. Do we need an interpretation of the interpretation of the interpretation? The church has a high regard for Muslims. No, it doesn't. Muslims are a horrible antichrist system that persecutes the church. Though Muslims worship the one true God, capital G. No, they don't. Because the one true God is Father, Son, and Spirit. There is no gen generic Unitarian God. And all of you Roman Catholics are lying to yourselves when you act like you don't have to accept this. When your Pope creates a giant three building Abu Dhabi faith center to the monotheistic God. That's not the Trinity. It's all in your face. So stop lying to yourself. The Muslims worship the same God that Abraham worshiped. No, they don't. Abraham worshiped the triad. And as it says right here, Hindus, Approach God in love and faith. No, they don't. Hinduism is a horrible, demonic system. And it does not allow you to approach God in love and faith. Stop lying to yourselves about you. The very actions of your papacy for the last 60 years, 70 years, tell you what your church believes about these religions. All right, we got a huge stack of people here. Nuologion. I'm you. All right, moving on. Hey, Jay. Yep. Hey, thank you. Uh, sorry, I, I was uh, struggling to unmute there. Hey. So um, I want to first of all thank you for what you just said because actually I was uh, part of what I wanted to cover. I read Nostra Aetate recently. I've, I've just been making my way through the documents that you suggest people to read, like Sadi's Cognitum, Vatican One, Nostra Aetate, and awesome. I feel like what happens is a lot of a lot of Catholics just don't read. No, the documents of course they don't. Of the Magisterium that they defend. Absolutely, yeah. Tell me about it. Um, so yeah, but I, what I wanted to talk to you about is I wanted to, uh, ask your opinion on some thoughts I had. I listened to, I actually re-listened to Lofton and Aiken's talk on, uh, theistic evolution and how, how, how it's basically like a totally legitimate opinion, uh, in, within Catholicism and it's magisterially, I guess, rubber stamped or, uh, yeah, or, or humani know, generis or whatever by Pius XII. Yeah, exactly. And, and there's a lot more than just humani generis too. The Aiken was bringing up stuff I had never heard about. So I was, yeah, well, I mean, it's already, by the way, is, is, hold on. you know, verified by them and they're proud of it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, um, this is the undoing of, uh, Romans 5 and Romans 8, because Romans 8 is very clear that all death, decay, and corruption entered as a result of Adam's sin. All of those people posit that there is death prior to the fall of Adam. By the way, that's condemned in, this, in the canons of the Sixth Council. So they actually are condemned by uh, the Sixth Council. Yes, and they always just resort to, like, there was a part where Aiken says, 
I think within my lifetime, there should be some kind of clarification and resolution. And they're, they're always resorting to like some future time when some future statement of some future Pope is going to make everything clear and it's all going to make sense despite yeah, because the they worship the, being oh. completely irres, irresolvable. They're yeah. not like, they're not things you could just have a Pope write something about and suddenly it's all going to make sense. But yeah, I mean, I the whole, the whole like religion is the worship of authority and faith in, uh, you know, the papacy fixing things or doing something better in the future. And, yeah, it's, it's all uh, man worship. And, yeah, Jimmy Aiken, by the way, uh, we played the clips a while back. Uh, he's, like, defending. Oh, Nestorius actually wasn't a heretic. Yeah, well, so Jimmy Aiken's a heretic. So avoid heretics. Yeah, that's all I say. Stuff from them, yeah. But specifically what I wanted to ask your comments about is uh, – there's a point where he mentions De Verbum, which I have not read, but I think you're probably familiar with it. And he brings up a point about De Verbum where uh, what's what's taught in that document about the interpretation of scripture is that the author's assumptions don't need... Uh, well, okay, the way he phrases it is that what's inspired are the author's assertions and not his assumptions. So when Peter is writing about the flood and he's uh, assuming that it was a global flood. That isn't necessarily inspired, but his assertion or the symbolic, um, the symbolic value of the statement he's making is the inspired part. And I'm just, I mean, I yeah, that's, like a, that's actually, it. but in my mind, this just completely destroys exegesis completely. Absolutely. Like, if you're, if you're going to read the old Testament in that way, you're just, you're just going to be, uh, I mean, the, the the things that the author assumes are are part of tradition. Obviously, so you're you're completely cutting down half half or more of tradition that Correct. way. And anyway, I just wanted to hear what you have to say on that on Dave Verbum specifically in that that uh, exegetical methodology because yeah, it this, seems to me like just, this is actually right. I'm glad you said that. Great point. Loved it. This is uh, actually one of the things that modernists propose. Uh, the modernists of the late 1800s, early 1900s in the Roman Catholic Church were proposing just precisely these kinds of splits and divisions. And so that allowance for the modernist exegesis based on higher critical studies, that's actually completely undermining of the whole position of biblical theology. Absolutely, 100%. And the irony is that those kinds of modernist positions were already condemned in Lamentabili and in Pius X's documents, right? So Pius X's Pacendi condemns these types of presuppositions of the modernists. And Lamentabili has a specific section. Uh, there's also the Syllabus of Errors that has a specific sections on um, errors in terms of interpretation of Scripture. And so it might not use the explicit wor wor wording of Dave Verbum, but obviously what Dave, Ver Dave Verbum is saying, which is a Vatican II document, right? about uh, inspiration interpret interpretation of scripture, right? Obviously it is saying that you can't divorce these two things. I mean, it would lead to all kinds of absurdity. And by the way, how could you, this is like deconstructionism or something. Like how do you divorce Peter's worldview from what he's writing? This is crazy. And and there's, no, there's nothing that tells you, by the way, where the uh, delineating line is. So exactly. like what... What is it, uh, wh where's the line between Peter's theological errors, because that's what, what it would amount to, theological, cosmological errors, and the ag exact writing of his text, right? And by the way, where does this come from? What church father ever said that there's a division between the potentially erroneous presuppositions that Peter has of his worldview versus what he actually wrote down? It's all just invented. And this, again... This is why all of these people, all the Roman Catholics, all the people that you hear that they don't even, they can't think through these things because they're deluded. This is what delusion does. It's a strong delusion. And they don't even see that this totally undermines what Romans 8 says about the cosmology of the universe. Paul says in Romans 8 that all death, all decay, all corruption is a result of of Adam and Eve's, and prior to that, Satan, Satan's fall and then Adam and Eve's fall. You can't have millions of years of death before Adam's fall. It does, it undoes the cosmological scope of Christ's redemption. And that's why these heretics don't believe in recapitulation. Every one of these people is a heretic who denies recapitulation because you can't believe in recapitulation without what I'm saying.
without the idea that Adam and Eve brought all forms of death, can and corruption. They don't understand that the cosmic scope of the fall is the presupposition of the cosmic scope of Christ's incarnation and redemption. It's that simple. And that, that's why they're heretics. Yeah, and they do the exact same thing with even papal documents. Like when it comes to the issue of papal communion, uh, the ones that, like who actually have read Quam Singulari know that uh, Pius X called not giving, not communing children a new practice. He literally used those words, and they'll just straight up deny that he's right about that. He, they'll, they'll just be like, well, the historical part of his encyclical isn't infallible, but. The rest, I mean, it's just constantly making these arbitrary distinctions. And it's like, all right, on what basis? I mean, have, these people have not read Saudi's Cognitum because if they did, then right. they'd know, like, the, the whole encyclical binds your conscience. Yeah. Whether it's a cathedra or, or ordinary magisterium, it doesn't matter. You can't just deny that uh, what, what, a, what a pope is saying about a historical truth is, right. is not true. Yeah. Um, well, thank you, Jay. I uh, I also want to mention that I read um, Paul Williams' book Operation Gladio. I recently finished it on your recommendation. I thought it was fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. So that's all from me. Yeah, thanks, man. Really great comments. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, uh, No Logion. Uh, great comments. Yeah, there you go. Trad cat, honest with himself, sees where it leads, saw the the conclusions, and realized. The track cats don't read their own documents. If they did, they would see this. Exactly. Alexander Harris, what's up? By the way, before we go to Alexander, hold on a few seconds. Uh, if, if, if you would for a second. Uh, Pavle Kovacek. Kovacevicic. Vichakachik. One dollar. Let's see who the first victim was. <laughs> Bread counter, five dollars. Can you talk about the rosary and its history? So the rosary is uh, not something that I would advocate for. Um, it's, it's usually pretty bound up with Roman Catholic doctrine of imaginative prayer. And we don't do that in orthodoxy. I'm sorry, it's not part of the orthodox tradition. And the Western Rite people that want to uh, import the rosary, I think it's a bad idea. So we don't want it in there. You don't need it. Bowie, 38338. Thank you for all your work. Thank you so much, Bowie. Cute little Gandalf. That's what I'm talking about. Hot, sexy little Gandalfs. Can you share your critique of John Locke and classical liberalism? Um, I have many podcasts that I've done critiques of classical liberalism. You can go back to the old podcast with Tim Kelly. Uh, you can do the, you can look at the critique I did of Jordan Peterson from six years ago. Um, I, I've done that so many times that it's just sort of like, how many times do I have to do it? Uh, I feel like you blame liberalism for everything. You hear me blame liberalism. I don't know what, do you mean by liberalism, classical liberalism? I don't know what you mean. Do I blame liberalism for everything? I don't typically do that. I blame uh, the fall <laughs> for for everything, not lib quote liberalism. Um, we drifted away from decentralized government. Yeah, I mean, this is just the narrative that you believe from the Enlightenment propagandists who have told you that uh, you know Adam Smith and David Ricardo and John Locke and all these goobers are sort of like the final word. And you understand that those people worked for uh, British East India Company and private corporations who became the next enslavers and the next tyrants. So you just believe a myth of the Enlightenment. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And I'm happy to debate any libertarian. In fact, I think we did. Uh, we, I debated Kokesh. The first debate I ever did was Kokesh. And the first half of the debate was theism. And then the second half was, I think, classical liberalism. I've asked all kinds of classical liberals to come and do debates and they just typically won't do it. Now we did do that debate with, um, Robert Taylor, like five or six years ago. We did two or three debates with him actually. Um, Dave Smith. I tried to get Dave Smith to do a debate. He wouldn't do it or just didn't see my tweets or something or whatever. I don't know. I'm not dissing him. I'm just saying that like any, any, Libertarian wants to come do a debate. It's open floor. Reach out to me. I'm very easy to get a hold of on Twitter. Majorian, $20. On the question of existence of grace outside the church, how do we define grace outside the church versus divine providence? Again, at the last time, I think it's either 13 or 15 of Maximus talks about the, the mode of the spirit's presence outside the church. So again, if there's no grace outside the church, we would never 
come to the church. Of course, there's grace. There's grace. Paul says the word is near you, even in your hearts to the pagans. That does not mean they're saved. So divine providence is a grace. Yes. But the Holy Spirit worked on Cornelius's heart before he was in the church. There's nothing wrong with that. Doesn't mean that they're saved as pagans. I'm not saying that. Doesn't mean that the Roman Catholics have the Eucharist either. I'm not saying that. Justinian's right, $10. I got into a discussion and debate with a guy at work. He brought up salvation and said he believed in sola fide. I said, you are in a uh, Baptist sect that is based on dialectical philosophy and not historic Christianity. Is that a good debate tactic or move? Um, yeah, I mean, if that's a fact and if, you know, you, you're buddies enough with the guy that you can, you know, just sort of lay it out that bluntly, then yeah, I think that's a great move. Why not? I mean, isn't that a fact? If he's a Baptist dude, then Baptists, you know, d date from basically the radical reformation. Where were the Baptists in the year 700? Where were the Baptists at the Council of Nicaea? They weren't there because they didn't exist. Elevate XXX $10. What's your opinion on John MacArthur? Uh, I don't have a lot of uh, positive things to say about any quasi Calvinist uh, self appointed Bible teacher. So I think John MacArthur is a heretic. Kevin Farrell $10. Watch this video. When you're done, it will freak you out. Uh, and then you have a link. Maybe I'll check it out. But then again, who knows what you've sent. <laughs> so I don't know if I want to check it out. Kristen, $5. Great job deflecting on that guy's uh, neuro-linguistic programming. We hate to see you get hypnotized on stream. Yeah, that's halfway a joke when I talk about the neuro. Like, I, I know that the people calling in and saying my name over and over and over are not actually doing NLP. Uh, but that actually is an NLP technique, right? That you, you people do to do a lot of like, like politicians go and study how to do NLP and they learn all this nonsense. So I'm halfway joking, but I just think it's dumb when people are like, Jay, Jay, look, look, bro. Jay, 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 look, Jay, Jay. It's I'm like, D what, why are you repeating my name? Like I'm the, we're the only two people here. There's no other possible person that you, like you're talking to me. You don't have to keep saying my name. I'm here, dude. Uh oh, look at that. Junior Gallo since $200. He's winning the Super Chat competition today. Thank you so much. That's a massive uh, uh, stream killing Super Chat. Thank you so much. Rolf Stakes, $10. It's been a long time since we've seen some of these classic names. Good to see you guys there. Thank you for the stream. Killing it as usual. I love all the sticky, sticky note maxing. Keep us in your, uh, viewers in your prayers. Well, keep me in your prayers. I need your prayers. Rigovich, 629. Thank you so much. Fake and gray, five dollars. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, who's up next? That would be me. Hey man, how's it going? What's up, dude? So I uh, just tuned into the stream and then came over here to Twitter at the end of your discussion about Vatican II's. Basically, all religions are approximating the same God, and then talking more specifically about do we worship the same God as the Muslims and the Jews? Mm -hmm. um, and so I wouldn't at all agree with the Vatican to um, kind of language. And I don't come from it in the sense of trying to justify any kind of Catholic document. Um, but I do, I am of the opinion that at least the Jews and the Muslims worship the same God. And, and I know you don't think that, but I want to at least state my case and, and see if you can well, try and dissuade me. Okay. I will let you state your case, but let's rewind sure. real quick. So before we do that though, do you profess to be some sort of Christian? I, no, no, I'm I'm not orthodox, and so uh, I. Well, hold on. Like ideologically, do, do you profess to be some Christian? Hold on. Like in reality and faith, no. So, are you Eucharist, agnostic? I don't have baptism. I don't have chrismation. Sorry, are you agnostic? Well, I don't understand. No, no, no. Ideologically, I, I agree with Orthodox Christianity. Yeah, and so God willing, but hold one on. Day I'll be orthodox. Okay. But, I okay. mean, it's just not the reality yet. Okay. Fair enough. So go ahead. Um. So. And, and one, one of the big things that I think uh, I, I use as reference uh, for justifying, at least I'm going to argue the Jewish case, and then by extension, if Jewish radical Unitarianism, as it's known today, could be um, could be also the same God that we worship, then I think it would extend to Islam. But we can we can argue that separately. So I'll just talk about the Jewish case. Um, in just in St. Justin Martyr's writings, in his first apology, he talks about how God appeared to Moses and is explaining to the Caesar that the Jews have a confusion between the Father and the Son when 
uh, the angel of the Lord appears at the burning bush. And Mm -hmm. I think the way that Justin Martyr couches this in context is that the Jewish God, even in this conception, is a close enough approximation to say that their confusion is classified as heresy, but not idolatry. And heresy being an approximation of the correct referent that um, that does not fit every characteristic necessary for it to be orthodox, but not lacking enough qualities um, to be referring to some other subject, some other god, or some other delusion. Yeah, but in or- um, hold on. So okay, in orthodox, so yeah, go, go ahead. In yeah. orthodox theology, I understand where you're going with that. Uh, but in orthodox theology, ultimately, this doesn't really matter because if you look at John Damascus's uh, uh, heresiology, how does he classify all the heresies? Or all, excuse me, how does he classify all the world religions? I don't know. As heresies. Uh, so ultimately, this doesn't really matter. Okay, so you would say that that according to that, heresy and idolatry are essentially the same thing, and that there isn't really a distinction there. Ultimately, yes. Okay, so would the implications of that be that all Catholics, even though they profess the creed because they use the filioque, would be idolaters and heretics? Absolutely. Okay, no, cool. That just clarifies your position. Um, oh, oh, could you... No, I guess, okay, if, if you can cite St. John Damascus. Right, that's giving me a lot to Yeah, think so about. if you Thank look you. at the, uh, I mean, what does St. Gregory Palamas say in the treatise on the, uh, Apodictic Treatise on the Holy Spirit? He says that the Roman Catholics have listened to Satan in their uh, heresy on the Filioque, and they've confused nature and person, and that thus that's lead, that leads them to their doctrine of created grace. Absolutely, but to say, to say that's the same thing as worshiping a different god, I, I don't, it is. I, I and he's, no, he hold on. So in Orthodox, the, listen, okay, in Orthodox ahead. theology, heresy is ideology. It, it's a delusion of worshiping a conceptual thing that is not the correct referent. Now, that doesn't mean that everybody, everybody that has anything wrong is automatically a damned heretic. Heresy is a specific sin. You're correct to say it is a specific sin of willful uh, error and persisting in that error. So that's why we don't call everybody necessarily a heretic per se, but John Damascus can also basically classify all of the world religions all the way back to the original idolatry in Genesis when man fell. He says that all of the uh, 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 pagan religions basically derive as a heresy from the original worship of the Trinity in the garden. Okay, well, that was really helpful about distinguishing the the willful persistence part, because I think maybe that addresses the other objection that I was going to bring, which was that, I mean, for uh, for every layman in the Orthodox Church to assume that they have a perfect understanding of the Trinity right. whenever they worship is right. like a little much to ask. Yeah, and also I don't have a problem in saying that, you know, uh, Justin Martyr, even though he's a saint, you know, uh, they can get things wrong and they can have sometimes have bad arguments. A lot of the apologists of that period, in fact, his disciple, I think Tatian, right? Tatian became a total heretic. So uh, just because Justin Martyr made this or that argument or whoever, like individual church fathers can make, you know, bad arguments. So um, I don't have a problem saying, yeah, well, that's a bad argument. So. Well, thank you, Jay. Yeah, good questions. Uh, Togo. Well, I want to remind you guys, if you head, head over to chalk.com, that's C-H-O-Q.com, you get access to the best supplements out there. You can get a hold of the Sheila Jet, which is great for mental focus and clarity. Use the promo code J50, that's J-A-Y-5-0, to get 50% off all of those excellent products. You can get the Action 2.0, which is excellent in terms of act- uh, uh, boosting your energy levels. You can get my favorite, which is the Tonka Ali, 100% proven to boost testosterone. Head on over there to chalk.com, the C-H-O-Q.com. Use the promo code J50 to get 50% off all of those excellent products. Read the papers and the reviews and see if you don't think that I'm right. You're going to see everybody loves it. Um, also, I would say uh, if you want to get recurring subscriptions, use the promo code J53LIFE. That's J53LIFE. If you want to see us live, we'll be doing a live event in Hollywood at uh, Van Nuys Airport 
in, that's a, there's a giant hangar basically it's not the airport but uh we'll be doing an event with jamie kennedy it's going to be a lot of fun it's a mix of the absurd with philosophy with real information exposés great stuff there's the tickets sign up now don't wait go ahead and get your tickets now it's not worth waiting until the last minute um it's, it's winding down on that so get your tickets also uh if you want to sign up for the orthodox italy pilgrimage we're going to be doing a full-on pilgrimage in italy uh you can go to my website and you, under every post you'll see the links for the uh for the show or excuse me for the uh, for the pilgrimage what's up man go ahead hello can you hear me yep okay sorry um I just have a question about, um, bro, you, you going into the haunted house, the basement, you going into the basement of the haunted house. What's up, man? It's all right. I just got, it's fine. It's fine. Go ahead. I can't hear you, dude. You're, you're, you're roboting, man. Try to come out and come back in. By the way, somebody said, we could see all your contacts on your phone. You're not seeing the contacts, dude. You're seeing the people that are in line in, in the quay to, to come on. You're not seeing contacts. We've got secret information. We've got to expose him. Uh, I don't know. Let's do... Let's do one more. Is there anybody who wants to bring on some disagreements? Stephen Young. This looks like somebody who wants to debate. Let's see. Hello? Yo, what's up? Uh, hey, man. Um, so, I'm a Catholic. Um, it's like a kind of a recent convert. And I just had a couple questions. Sure. Um, I've been uh, considering orthodoxy now for just like a couple months. And my biggest concern is about the divine simplicity versus um, the essence energies distinction. And uh, Catholics keep telling me to look at Scotism as if it's some kind of a, like a compromise. Uh, could you tell me more about that? Yeah. So, I mean, the issue, what they're misunderstanding is that the issue is, <laughs> can you mute? Mi dude, please mute. Go. Bro, mute. Yeah, so the issue is not merely a matter of the status of the distinctions between the attributes, right? So the idea that this is only a question of the relationship of God in his simplicity to the multiplicity of attributes is a fundamental misunderstanding of the scope of this issue. It's also an issue that relates directly to Christology, because the Energies Doctrine, if you read John Damascus in Book 3, is immediately applied to Christology, two wills and two energies. And the energies in Christ in his incarnate state are necessary to understand the multiplicity of his actions as incarnate, you see. So it's not just a matter of distinctions in Trinity or God proper. It's also crucial to understanding the reality of Christ incarnate in his two wills and two energies. The essence energy distinction is specified and hammered out not ultimately in Trinitarian theology, but in Christology. And Roman Catholic theology is deficient also in Christology. Now, that's not because they don't give verbal credence to the Sixth Council. They do. But they don't really understand the theology of the Sixth Council, nor is it really relevant to their system as a whole. And the reason for that is that they, if it was, they would understand that the Sixth Council is not just about speculations of energies, it's about how we participate in God. You cannot have a real co coherent doctrine of transubstantiation or of the real presence without the energies. Ephesus and St. Cyril make clear as day that the presence of Christ in the Eucharist is the uncreated energies, plural. That's what you partake of. So Roman Catholic theology has dogmatized that what you partake of in grace is a supernatural accident in the in the soul. A created accident in the soul. Supernatural created accident in the soul. That is impossible with Orthodox theology. It's impossible with the Eucharist. 
Cyril says in the two letters to six census that what we partake of in the Eucharist is the uncreated glory that the logos transmitted to his human nature. Because what you partake of in the Eucharist is the deified flesh of Christ, deified by the uncreated energies. You can't be deified by creation. So they've missed that the essence, even in the Palamite debates, is not about theoretical distinctions or the theology proper of the Trinity. It's about participating in the Logos, participating in uncreated energy. Scotism doesn't solve that, doesn't answer that, doesn't deal with that. Palamas is very clear in the debate with Barlium, excuse me, with Akandinos and Barlium, the dialogue with the Barlamite, that the key issue is about participating. If you don't have the uncreated energies doctrine distinct from the essence, you don't have a doctrine of participation that makes any sense. Are you eating the divine essence when you eat the Eucharist, Roman Catholics? It's already defined at Ephesus what you're eating, a la Cyril the uncreated immortal glories. And Cyril says, that is not the essence. That means essence energy distinction, Roman Catholics. But you don't read those things. You don't read Cyril. You don't read Ephesus. You don't read what's in the sixth council. And so you don't even know that what I'm telling you is fundamental to all of these things. So it doesn't matter. It wouldn't matter if a Roman Catholic theologian said, I believe in a real distinction between the divine attributes. It's not a matter of, do you have room for a school of philosophy within Roman Catholicism's umbrella that allows for believing in real distinctions and attributes? It doesn't matter. It's not a theoretical question. It's an actual praxis question about what we participate in. And that has to be uncreated energy. And that's already defined. And so Rome has already departed from this doctrine by dogmatizing that the grace that we get is a supernatural creature. That's heresy. All right. Thank you, guys. A lot of fun today. Uh, we're going to call it a day. Everybody have a good evening and a lot of fun today. We only had like one or I think we only had one troll, right? We didn't, we didn't hit our... Uh, two troll limit that we expected, but that's okay. Uh, 